Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 764 that is Siete Seis Cuatro with I, your host, Agostino Zynga and I hope you're doing well wherever this lovely show may find you. I hope you're doing swimmingly. How am I? All good, all things considered. All good, all things considered. I cannot complain. I cannot cry. I cannot be upset. I cannot moan. Everything is fine on my side of the hood. So, let's just get started then, isn't it? Breaking news. I think this happened a few hours ago um, since I last have been on the internet and shit. Regarding the one and only OJ Simpson, dead at 76 years old. RIP OJ Simpson. Um, I wasn't aware that he was battling cancer. Um, it appears that he probably might have kept that quite private to some extent. Maybe people did know, but I probably really wasn't aware of it. Um, I've seen him a lot on the Cameron and May show. But then finally enough, I did see a clip of him on the Cameron and May show discussing it. He didn't really get into it a lot. He said he was going to fight it, whatever. He said he'd be okay. But I guess it wasn't something that he wanted to talk about, you know, often, which is pretty, you know, which is pretty admirable in that regard. When people have those sort of um, terminal illnesses and they decide to just deal with it privately and they don't basically want to talk about it that much and just want to be with their family. You you know, I, I respect that a lot. I really do because I feel like nowadays people use any anything that happens to them as an opportunity to get attention. As sick and as mad as that can be, we all know that to be the case. We've already seen it with flipping gender reveals, right? What are gender reveals? Gender reveals aren't, you know, they're not, they're not, they're, they they're don't exist other than just to give the parents attention and to kind of scratch that itch and give them a non-stop fucking, you know, lying lineage of fucking content they can put out um, about their kid and shit without their consent. Whatever, we move on. So this is Coach of TMZ. OJ Simpson dead at 76 after cancer battle. Let's actually read the actual article below. It says, OJ Simpson, one of the most famous um, high-profile American um, of all time, is dead after a cancer battle. Um, it says, here's a quote from the family of OJ Simpson on his actual um, official Twitter account. So no more hello Twitter worlds. It says, on April 10th, our father, Oriental James um, Simpson, um, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asks that you please respect his wishes, their wishes, sorry, for privacy and grace, the Simpson family. You don't really, that's a that's a real old guy name, isn't it? He must have been born in, what, the 50s or something? Maybe even earlier than that? Oriental. Oriental. There's probably not a lot of kids who have been born Oriental, right? Or Oriental James. I guess it might be double barrel, but yeah. RIP to Oriental James Simpson. It continues a former NFL great who stood trial for the double murder of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and another friend Ron Goldman in the 90s only to be acquitted passed away Wednesday in Las Vegas this according to his family. They said that he was surrounded by his children, his grandchildren when he died on Wednesday night Simpson's attorney confirmed. I wonder if one of his kids, one of his Gen Z kids, one of his Gen Z grandchildren leant in and said Grandad, Grandad, come on you can tell me. Come on Grandad, you can tell me. Did you do it? <laughs> I wonder if one of the grandkids let in on his da- on his on his deathbed and said, "Grandma, come on, you can tell me. You're gonna go out now. You can tell me. Did you actually do it? Because that's the one question that I've always been astounded by. Because if you watch the documentaries, if you watch some of the old footage, if you see the evidence, it's pretty astounding he got away with it. Especially being a black guy, especially back then, that goes to show you the power of talent, the power of sport. He was so good at football, people were willing." to convince themselves that he didn't commit that double murder. <laughs> People were willing to convince themselves that some other black guy, because I remember, I think there was actually a witness. Some witness said they saw like a big black dude walking towards Nicole Brown's house. So we have to now suspend belief that another black dude was out to kill Nicole Brown. I think at the time as well, which is really sad. I think she was pregnant at the time as well. I think so. I think she, she wasn't showing um, a lot, but I think she was pregnant. And then um, he obviously ended up murking, allegedly murking the guy friend as well, who dropped off the sunglasses, who I think people suggested that guy friend and Ron Goldman was a, was a gay best friend or something or whatever. But still, bloody hell, bro. Nearly cut off fucking Nicole Brown's head with the force that he uh, allegedly, with the force that whoever did it allegedly um, struck her the neck with. I remember seeing one documentary about it where they said that there were like blood trails next to the door or i think blood trails leading up to his house the other glove that used in the murder was found at his house it's like you see all this evidence and you're like hold on so how did he get away with this 
Like, especially when you think about the Tory Lanez trial, right? That happened recently. The Tory Lanez trial, if I'm not mistaken, like, there wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't equivocally, they could prove that he actually shot Megan Thee Stallion. I think there were proof that he maybe held a gun, but then the theory is with people that defend Tory, oh, he held the gun because he was wrestling it off of Kelsey, the, the former best friend. But they couldn't prove it, but they still put him in jail for, for prison for over 10 years or whatever, maybe. So you look at that, you're like, rah, the court system is so random, isn't it? Because on one end, you know, we know she got hurt in Megan Thee Stallion, but we can't we can't definitively prove how she got hurt. Did she step on glass after the bullet ricocheted off the window? Did she get shot directly in the foot? Like, what happened? We don't know. We don't know who exactly did it, but we still put someone in prison. With the OJ thing, all the evidence was pointing towards some black guy <laughs> that Nicole Brown knows probably murdered her and her friend, yet you can't convict him. It shows how different the world was back then. Maybe with evidence... Maybe with lack of DNA, whatever. Even the glove scene is hilarious, right? The glove scene is fucking hilarious. As if that proves anything. It's fucking, it's so fucking dumb. But let's continue anyway. OJ had reportedly been battling prostate cancer in recent years and his health took a turn for the worse um, with him landing in the hospice care within the, first, within the past few months. Um, word about OJ's cancer diagnosis first made the rounds in February with the local um, outlet reported that although the details were hazy as OJ's response to the news at the time when he denied that he was in hospice but didn't address the cancer report. Okay, cool. Um, adding to the mystery was the fact that OJ touched on the cancer diagnosis in 2023 with a video posted when he said he caught some form of cancer but suggested he beat it. In any case, the cancer came back and claimed his life about a year later. OJ had been looking frail and leading up to the passing, including an outing in January when he spotted using a cane. The last time OJ posted a video of himself talking about the Super Bowl, where he said he was rooting for his former team, the San Francisco 49ers. He seemed to be in good shape, spirits then, and he was seated in a clip talking from the backyard. That jersey probably still goes for a lot of money now, isn't it? That's, look, look at the, f back in the day, football jerseys were fucking amazing. I wonder why they don't play on AstroTurf anymore. I guess it's probably like for injuries, right? For those of you who play, who those of you in America who watch football and stuff, I would love you to let me know, like, what the hell, why did they stop playing on AstroTurf? Because if I zoom in on the pictures, some of these players have, like, regular running shoes on, like, regular sneakers and shit. I wonder why you guys stopped playing on AstroTurf. It looks fucking cool, I'm not going to lie, with the long socks and the fucking quarter-length trousers. The kits back in the day look so good. It goes without saying OJ's life was uh, monumentous for a variety of reasons, lots of good and bad, especially later, post-football years. Before that, though, he was a beloved All-American hero on the field, a Heisman winner from USC and a Buffalo Bills legend. Even after football, he was a bona fide um, A-list in Hollywood, acting in tons of movies and TV shows and famously serving as a face and pitchman for Hurts for many, many, many years. Of course, um, all of that goodwill left in the 1990s when he was accused of heinous murder. Nicole Brown was so beautiful, isn't it? Like, bloody hell, OJ. What, the, what, what would have made you so angry, allegedly, to kill her? She was so beautiful. What could she have done? I wonder. Was it cheating? Did they just have an argument? Did you just snap? Was it CTE? God almighty, man. She was a very attractive woman. Um, his death marks the end of a multi-decade saga of crime and intrigue surrounding OJ, which peaked after the brutal slayings of Nicole and Ron in 1994. In the aftermath of what was dubbed as a trial of the century when OJ was prosecuted on national TV. There's Ron as well, RIP to Ron Goldman. Even before he was apprehended by the police for questioning in the immediate aftermath of the murder, OJ led the cops on a low-speed chase. Yeah, the Bronco scene. Honestly, what? imagine being in America at the time parking your car and seeing former Heisman winner, right? Legend in football, OJ Simpson cohering, you know, tearing it up down a fucking freeway, driving his Ford Bronco. Like, you, it, it probably must have been surreal to see this pan out with massive amounts of cops chasing him, like old school GTA style, hol helicopters above. It must, look at the people. They're everywhere, hanging on, looking, watching this thing. It must have been so wild to see this in real time. <laughs> it must have been so wild. <laughs> Once he was caught, a case started to form with him as a prime suspect. Prosecutors eventually charged him, alleging that OJ carried out the horrific stabbing deaths of Nicole and Ron at the Brentwood home in June, on June 12, 1994. OJ hired a so-called dream team of defense lawyers led by the Johnny Cochran who ran point and helped pick apart the state's case. A fundamental um, element of Cochrane latched onto during the case was the fact that LAPD detective Mark Falcom um, had made racist remarks in the past, which OJ's defensive team suggested led him to planting a bloody glove at Simpson's home. 
that works as a defense. Oh, the cop planted the glove. Yeah, you know, back in the day, that's why I would imagine guys who are in, into crime, career criminals, will probably tell you getting away with crimes in the eighties and nineties must have been such a blast. You could probably rob a bank, get away with murder. So it's so much easier back then, especially without CCTV and shit. You could get away with so much stuff back then. You probably can't get away with it, nothing nowadays, which is why probably people do a lot of like petty crime stuff. But actual legit murder and like, you know, other shit, it's not going to happen. There's no way you're getting away with that shit. There's too much cameras and fucking, what you call it? Um, cameras on people's houses and shit as well. Ring cameras and shit. It's impossible. This also led to another pivotal point of the trial when OJ's team requested to be allowed to try on the gloves in court and they ended up not fitting him perfectly, which is dumb because why does it matter if the gloves don't fit perfectly? Do you know what I mean? What does that actually prove? It's such a dumb point. Like People wear gloves that don't fit all the time. <laughs> anyway, that prompted Cochrane to eventually utter the famous line during the closing, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. In the end, the jury bought the case. OJ was, which again is another proof that in court cases it's not about whether someone's guilty or not, it's whatever you can prove they're guilty or not. OJ was acquitted of the murder charges. Um, he was sued by the Goldmans and Browns in civil court for wrongful death, and that case played out in Santa Monica, where a jury found him liable for the deaths of Nicole and Ron. He was ordered to pay tens of millions of dollars. So he was found liable for the deaths, but he wasn't found guilty of the murders. <laughs> Honestly, but as a black man, I don't know how he did it, but fucking hell absolutely wild despite being dodged um dogged by the families for the money oj mostly avoided paying the judgment he didn't even pay and eventually filed um fled los angeles and settled down in, in las vegas where other legal trouble started to find him including tax woes and eventually another criminal case in 2007 he was accused of busting into a vegas hotel room in an attempt to recover sports memorabilia that he believed had been stolen from him rolling up to confront the new owner with a bunch of goons in tow armed with weapons too <laughs> yeah, OJ is just a bad. OJ, even in these old years, was out here trying to be a stick up guy, a stick up granddad. Stick up granddad, you know. Fucking hell, OJ. Relax, bro. He eventually was arrested, charged, and prosecuted, and eventually. And, and the person that stole the things as well, you're a bitch. The person that stole his memorabilia and then fucking filed a police report, you're a fucking bitch. You know what I mean? Like, it, there should be some honor amongst thieves. There isn't, but there should be. He was eventually charged. And prosecuted and ultimately convicted on all charges, OJ was then in prison for a long time until he was released on parole in 2017. Once OJ got out of prison, he ended up settling down in Sin City, where he lived a relatively private and peaceful life out in the public eye, although he was active on social media, often posting on Twitter and X with opinions on sports, politics and others. Of course, his reputation was completely destroyed by then, partially because many believe he was actually confessed to the 94 killings in a book and subsequent interview he did. Yeah, the book is fucking amazing. What's the book again? Um, I think it's like, it's O.J. Simpson. I didn't, it's like something, I didn't kill my wife or something. It's, I didn't, let's see, I didn't kill my wife. I think that's the cover of it. I remember seeing an old picture of it back in the day. It's fucking wild. Yeah, there we go. He put he put this fucking book out. Imagine. Imagine how much of a psycho you have to be to put a book like this out. <laughs> I didn't kill my wife, but if I did, here's how I do it. He was literally spitting in the face of the courts, like giving no fucks in the slightest. Can you imagine a black man in 2024 getting away with this? It's impossible. Never happening. That they'll get away with it. Even LeBron James couldn't get away with this. You know what I mean? And he's really good at basketball. Like, there's just something about OJ back in the day that just, I don't know, people just, you know, were drawn to and they were like, hey, you know what? He didn't do it. He didn't fucking do it. If he said he didn't do it, he didn't do it. Um, of course, his reputation was completely destroyed by then, partially because many believe he actually confessed to the 94 killings in a book and subsequent interview he did in the 2000s, touting it as hip uh, hypothetical, plus everything else that had transpired over the years. Um, look at that. Look at the scene, bro. The amount of blood. God almighty. And yet, and he was also approached by lots of fans, post prison centers, posing for pics often. He was also said to still have support by some of his family, including his children. OJ was 76. Now, that's one thing, right? Have you guys heard this theory? Have you guys heard this theory that I just learned about on Twitter about his son? Allegedly, there's a theory out there that OJ actually was protecting his son who actually did the murder. He took the fall for his son. 
fucking wild. Let's play this clip. Courtesy, I don't know who's this. Um, it's a content creator on TikTok. Her name is Ray Spirits. Ray spelled R A E underscore S P I R I T S on TikTok. This is a fucking crazy video, but listen to this. Not sure if I buy it, but listen to this anyway. So I've always been like 100% team OJ Simpson is guilty. Recently, it was brought to my attention to check out his son, Jason. Here's what I found. Prior to the killings, Jason was diagnosed with intermittent rage disorder. He had stopped taking his medication two months before the murders. He wrote a note in which he talked about killing anyone who hurt a loved one of his. In his past, Jason had nearly killed a girlfriend and seriously injured another. At the time of the murders, he was on probation for attacking his boss with a knife. He has Jesus. no alibi that can be supported as to where he was during the murders. His time card for work that night was handwritten, even though the electric clock was working. A black navy watch cap with animal fur on it was found at the crime scene. Photographs obtained from Jason's storage locker show that he wore them often and that he had a dog. In this locker was also a knife that matched the description of what was used for the murders. He had field knife training from the Navy Academy. The day after the murders, OJ hired a top criminal attorney to defend Jason, although he wasn't a suspect. Police never even tested the fingerprints found at the scene or the DNA under Nicole's fingernails against Jason. After hearing all this, what do you guys think? <sighs> That is wild, if true. If the whole reason this went where it went was because OJ was doing what any probably parent would do and defending his son who actually did the murder. Yikes. I don't know what's true. don't know what isn't true. But either way, what a crazy end to a um, very crazy story, to be completely fair. It would be nice if we would get the truth about it. We probably will never get the truth, completely honest. It's probably just one of those things we just have to kind of, you know, decide, hey, it's kind of over with. But the really funny thing about it is that... um. Khloe Kardashian's been trending too because people believe that Khloe, you know, um, what you call it, people believe that OJ Simpson's actually Khloe Kardashian's real dad because I think at one point he dated, you know, um, cross the Chris Jenner back in the day uh, or maybe they might have hooked up and shit. So she's been trending too at the same time. People basically sending out condolences and sorry for your loss and shit. I was fucking laughing. I was literally laughing when I saw that shit. But yeah, RIP OJ Simpson. Um, whether or not we'll ever find out if he did it or not is remains to be seen. But, you know, according to the evidence, according to what you see online, it's just like, it's impossible that he didn't do it. <laughs> you know, it's one of those type of things. And it's quite wild that he got away. He didn't really get away with it because he got a quitted answer. But, you know, it's kind of wild. But either way, RIP OJ Simpson, RIP OJ Simpson. Let's continue on with that one so this is a quite an interesting one this is courtesy of um tmz and i've been interested in this because i actually wanted to see how this would develop and evolve so um kanye bought this amazing mansion in malibu right right on the seafront um that was designed by um legendary art legendary architect um what's his name tado what's his fucking name tado ando back in the day right who would design this amazing apartment also this amazing house um on in Malibu, right? Amazing mansion. And Kanye bought this, and I think the idea that he had when he bought it was that he wanted to take out all the windows, and he just wanted it to be like a free-flowing kind of structure, maybe with some sort of sheets to keep out some elements, but he didn't want any, like, permanent structural windows, and he wanted just a clear, you know, line of sight to the sea and the ocean and shit. And I thought, archit architecturally, design-wise, it was quite an interesting proposition, so I was interested to see how it was going to play out. But I guess local planning permission and building whatever regulations meant that he couldn't do it. So he had to scrap the plan. And then, of course, Kanye just, like, fucking got fed up at the house and, and, put up for this, and put it up for sale. But he hasn't been able to sell it at all. So he's really struggling to sell it. And I'm wondering at the moment, is this an indication of, like, how far his star has fallen, that people don't want to even buy his house? They don't even want to be associated with a house that he bought um, you know, and buy it with their own money because they don't want the association of being you know, seen as some sort of anti-Semite. Or is it the fact that he just might have bought a bit of a lemon of a house that most people don't really want? It's probably not the structure people would want to live in anyway. And it will probably require too much work to get it back up to where it needs to be, especially if you're already going to put 40 million down because, you know, the real, the real kind of... Um, what you call it, value, or the real kind of, the reason why this has cost so much, apart from it obviously being designed by a legendary architect, is the location, right? The location is probably way more uh, valuable than the actual house, house itself. So maybe there's a, there's a, you know, there's a suggestion you could probably knock it down and start again, but I'd imagine that would also cost an arm and a leg. So this courtesy of TMZ. Um, it says, turns out that real estate is not all about location, location, location. Because Kanye West has gutted Malibu Mansion, not a hot ticket item, and he slashed the cost a lot to sell it. TMZ has learned that the Malibu Mansion's price came down on Wednesday. It started out at $53 million, 
price hike in January, and now it's dropped to 39 million this week. And for those that are bad at math, that's a 40 million dollar reduction. Crazy. 53 to 39 is fucking wild. Because imagine buying it at fucking 53 and then finding out they will have taken 39. Absolutely crazy. Um, the drop isn't that too shocking. The house doesn't even really have walls and it's basically feels somewhat uninhabited at the point. So whether someone buys it, it needs to be very serious renovations to the property. It'll probably end up costing them a ton to do that. As we reported, Ye's been trying to unload expensive, um, expensive house since December and he even listed it as Sunny, even listed Sunny Sunset star Jason Oppenheim. Oh, his name's Jason Oppenheim, not Oppenheim, but Oppenheim to make it happen. He sounds like a Jew as well. Hey, Kanye got Jew friends, eh? Um, Jason told us that at the time that he wasn't worried about the serious renovations needed, saying the house is basically a blank canvas and allows a new owner to tailor it to their needs. Seems not a lot of uh, prospective owners are jumping at the listing, though the house is sort of languishing in the middle of the craziest residents communities in Los Angeles. But to be fair, though, it makes it does make sense why it doesn't why it's not being sold in it. You think about we're in a recession again. We're always fucking in a recession. But just considering the amount of work, the amount of money it would actually cost to get it up to looking habitable, because that's what it used to look like, right? This is what it used to look like. You've got these nice, you know, nice kind of balcony, these amazing seats here, nice, um, you know, floor to ceiling windows. You've got some great interior bits in there, some wood paneling, probably a lot of stuff that you can probably move around, modular stuff. So you have to do a lot of work to get this up and running, to get this ready to go, because it's literally just a shell of a place. Now, that being said, this will be a great location for a rave. If you were in, you know, in the market of posting or, you know, doing one of those fucking DIY pop-up raves no one fucking knows about, right? Hushy, hushy. That'd be a good location. The only, only you know, harm is that you're with two neighbours either side who are probably going to be at home. And it's Malibu. So most likely they have a direct line to the police. So the moment you turn on the music, someone's going to call the police, they're going to be there in fucking five seconds. So it's probably not even worth trying to put it on, but it'll be a great location for a party, for sure. That's a great rave location, I'm not going to lie. Uh, by the way, four plus thousand square feet house has four bedrooms, five bathrooms, beautiful outdoor decks with views of the Pacific Ocean and close proximity to restaurants, shopping and more in Malibu. Now, I've only had some windows. <laughs> uh, OK, cool. So I guess I can't. Man. I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of sad because I really like these in-ear monitors. I guess I have to buy some that don't have um fucking a mic attached to it. Because I really like these Indian monitors. I'm not going to lie. I really fucking like them. I appreciate you guys. You guys are fucking amazing. Thank you for the stream chat for helping me out. Thank you to the stream chat for helping me out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another one to talk about. Have you guys heard about this story? This is a pretty wild one, right? So this lady um, decided to post on social media that her husband went missing. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but I've always admired guys who do this sort of stuff. <clears throat> not because I want to do it, not because it's admirable, but just more so admired the balls on a man who could just walk out on his family. It's one thing to walk out on your partner. I think we all probably have the ability to do that, especially if it's becoming super toxic and you don't know how to leave well. I think we all have the capacity to just stand up one day and just leave our partner if we don't have any kids and shit. Fair enough. But if you have kids, you, you actually have an actual family to just stand up and leave is fucking wild like the com you know the the running meme the running joke of like oh daddy went to go get some milk kind of thing right like i can't imagine doing that like i can't imagine having the balls to do that so when i see these stories i'm like bloody hell man the guys that do this sort of stuff must they must be made of some other shit they must be made of some other shit so it's courtesy of tmz women women sorry women women searches for women and um, women search for husband mia husband i'm filing for divorce thanks to the internet for tracking him down Ashley McGear, the woman who went viral by asking the internet sleuths to locate her missing husband and now that she found him is ending the marriage TMZ has learned. Ashley tells TMZ she received a text from her estranged husband Charles after the Facebook plea blew up online. She says Charles who goes by the name Charlie says he's willing to sit down and talk after Ashley walking out on the kids last year. Sit down and talk. You know what's funny as well? 
the husband, if I'm not mistaken, somebody found out that he was on like Top Chef or something. So as you can see in this picture, if you're not watching the video, um, I'm going to describe it to you. It's a picture of him in a restaurant somewhere. It's, I guess a restaurant that he worked at, kind of, you know, showing off that he's a Top Chef there probably, holding some dishes and shit, blah, blah, blah. So he allegedly is a legit chef, like a really good one. He was on a TV show um, and he works as a chef. That's what he does. So clearly being a good looking dude, who actually works as a chef if you go to another place in america most likely if you're you know if, if you're how most people are in the restaurant industry and you're fucking crazy cokehead you love to be you love to you love to fuck random fucking women that come into the bar and you're a bit of a lad your name's gonna get around so he was dumb because it's not like he switched careers and just kind of kept his head low or went to go work on an oil rig somewhere he went to another state and just picked up his career and just changed his name but it's like, bro, people will know you. You're easily recognizable. You're just redhead, good looking dude who is a chef. Do you know what I mean? And loves to lay pipe. You're going to fucking get found out. So I think some women on women online basically found him. Most of them found him through dating apps, casual, obviously. So he left his kids and he was still ready to fuck. He just didn't want to fuck his wife. And he also didn't want to look after his kids. So they found him on loads of um, dating apps. And then, of course, they found him working at some restaurant like you know being a head guy there and doing pretty well so it was pretty easy to kind of find him but the post itself was kind of hilarious and kind of tragic so this is the woman that she posted the thing on and again this is why you see the power of social media because facebook is a platform that i barely use if ever and it's still stuff on there ends up becoming viral on the internet so this woman just posted stuff i guess on her own private or like personal fucking facebook and somehow it was ended to kind of end, ended up being on the big web and stuff but i think the other part why this will end up blowing up i think there's a group there's a specific group on twitter that i've seen about women uncensored and there's a particular group i think on facebook about um i forgot the title but basically the the group is for women who are trying to look for guys who walked out on them and, you know, they obviously locate these guys super fast because women are incredibly good at kind of, you know, internet stalking and shit. Anyway, going back to this, this woman posts originally, um, it's, her name is Ashley McGear and she posted this. I'm really about to test the power of Facebook with this one. This is my husband, Charles. And again, that's the picture above, right? Um, he loves to be the center of attention, but I'm not sure how much he's going to like this. Last year, when I was pregnant with our youngest baby, <laughs> so they already have one already. She's pregnant again with another one. Last year, when I was pregnant with our youngest baby, he decided to being a husband and a dad wasn't the lifestyle he wanted anymore. And he ghosted, like gone without a trace. Imagine ghosting your family. When you hear the term ghosting, you think of like young kids. You think of like young people who are unable to like, you know, who are unable to be honest with about their emotions, about their feelings. They're unable to have uncomfortable conversations. So the easiest thing they do is ghost. I think I've done it in the past. We've all probably done it. It's not a good thing. I think ghosting is abhorrent. You should always tell people and vocalize and say suit with your words and be very clear. And of course, if they continue. You can then decide to block or delete or do whatever. But the idea of just like ignoring somebody and hoping they get the message is kind of brutal, especially if you've been talking before. Like that switch is kind of wild to kind of see play out in real time. You go from hanging out and being cool, and then suddenly the person gets disinterested and you don't hear from them again. I think it's awful. But when you hear the term ghosting, you think of like Gen Zs or like really young millennials. You don't think of like adult adults, you know, like, again, they could be young, but you don't think, you don't think, you'd, especially people that have families, you don't think of like a family man ghosting his family. You think of somebody that maybe changed his mind during an engagement process or whatever. Cool. Anyway, he goes to his family. Um, he was, he has one baby he hasn't seen in over a year. Can you imagine? that's why i think this is a controversial statement but hey bear with me that's why i've always thought guys who go out of their way to do that whole like oh now i have a kid i'm a changed man i'm lasered in i'm focused um when that baby came out when it smiled when the baby said the first word it changed something in me the connection's different i think that's just all like platitudes and pleasantries to make you sound like a good guy to make you sound like a beast of a dad i think it's all very much case by case I think there are some guys, their partner has a baby and it's just like another day. It doesn't really matter. They don't really care. If anything, it's an inconvenience. So I think this idea that, oh, when you get a baby, things magically change. It's like, no, it doesn't. It's like they do the same thing with women. They think like if a woman's super like, you know, um, irresponsible and ratchet and not taking responsibility of her life, suddenly she's going to have a baby and it's going to be different. It's like, no, 
it's not the case. It's like it's either you are going to be that person, you are going to grow up or not, or you know, it kind of is what it is. Um, because I think I've heard Bill Burr do it. Bill Burr was the best of example. I think he was like, you know, I think he basically quit drinking because he had kids, and he was like, oh, he never wanted to be the guy who kind of comes home hungover and his kids see him, or he's hungover in the morning and they see him. He just didn't want that around, so he decided to quit. But I'm sure there are some people out there who have kids and who just decide when the kids in the next room they just have a line. When the kids are next room, they have a beer. Do you know what I mean? It's just like another thing. It's like they don't really care. It doesn't change how they act or how they behave at all in the slightest. So the whole like, oh, I have a kid thing and now I'm different. It's bullshit. It continues. He's moved somewhere out of state and changed his number. <laughs> Leaving your wife pregnant with another baby is the most scumbag shit you could ever do. I swear to God. That's like top level scumbag. That's up there with like smashing your best friend's wife or something. Do you know what I mean? Or like smashing your best friend's daughter or something. You know what I mean, like that's like on that level. That is so scumbaggy to leave your wife with a baby and another one coming, one in the oven and one that he, like, and then not seeing them in a year. Wow, what a piece of shit! Divorcing someone who's completely unreachable is really tough and drawn out. So I'm trying to track him down to get the signature on a few papers so I can finally close this chapter. I love how she said that in the second paragraph. She was like, "Look, I'm not trying to get him back to because I want him." I want to divorce him and he'd be out of my life. I like how cutthroat this woman is. I've already, I've heard he's going by Charlie now. <laughs> he's a British and very charming. Oh, he's from England. Fuck. Big up, big up, big up. It, it makes sense though, isn't it? Look at this guy. He's, he, he could definitely steal your girl. You know what I mean, Charles can definitely fucking steal your girl. Um, He's British and charming as fuck. He's a chef and probably working in the hospitality industry somewhere. He's probably never mentioned having a wife or kids back in Massachusetts. Uh, if you know him, you're going working with him. If you're dating him or friends with him, can you please give him, um, get in touch with him and let him know where I can find him? All the girls out there, feel free to share. A friend of a friend of a friend has got to know where he is. And then the update guys this is absolutely insane i figured maybe someone in my area will still be in touch with him but i absolutely did not expect this i've gotten more and more and enough information to locate him i've literally had hundreds of messages to sort through some with information and some with support and i appreciate all of them single mums are a special breed and i know a lot of you have gone through the same situation i have that's the thing that's really sad about this situation single mums are a special breed but it's all it's all very common so it makes you think what is it about guys what is it about piece of shit guys that women just can't seem to get get away from it's almost like a moth to a flame it's almost like a like a you know like a fucking like a moth to a fucking light you know it's gonna kill you you know it's gonna be to your detriment but you just can't stop yourself being attracted to it like why do women seem to be always drawn to these because in my experience from my little anecdotal experience in life usually piece of shit guys are not the there are some piece of shit guys who are du who are duplicitous, who are liars, who are able to put on a different mask and shit. But for the most part, piece of shit guys are very easy to tell. They have red flags that come up super early. And for some reason, women largely seem to want to ignore them. Or maybe in their head, they're like, you know what, I can fix him. So it's not as if they, these guys are like lying all the way. Yes, there are some that lie, I get it. But for the most part, they're very... I won't say they're honest, but their actions are honest. Their actions speak more than their words. So you could you could tell from how he acts and behaves, how he talks to you, right? That he's clearly like not a good dude, right? He's clearly up to no good. He's clearly gonna cause you a lot of heartbreak and pain, but they just can't stop themselves from being attracted to these type of people. So it's it, it wouldn't surprise me if, if Charles here had another family in wherever he was located at, do you know what I mean? Or he was in a serious relationship with somebody else. And it's like, come on, man. Like, don't you think it's a bit odd that you just bumped into this random guy that keeps moving around from state to state, doesn't stay in one location, doesn't seem to have any close friends, you know, like, <laughs> doesn't seem to want to talk about his past too much. Like, there's probably signs that this guy is like, up to no good and he's definitely hiding something but again women seem to love these guys it's unbelievable like a guy like this is not short of options always has kids always seems to have a has a you know a baddie to his side and shit it's kind of wild i'm not gonna lie please know that i truly do not wish him any type of ill will oh wow what a mature what a lovely mature lady fucking hell um i i since she basically realized that she married an absolute psycho and she just wants him out of her life as cleanly as possible 
She doesn't want any crazy shit because she knows he's a psycho. God forbid he turns into OJ or something. Do you know what I mean? So she's probably doing that. But she probably was like, you know what? I got duped. Fair play. You got me there, right? You got me there. You know, twice, once bitten, twice shy. Fine. But she just wants, just stay away from me. Stay away from me and the kids. Don't worry. I've got money. I'll look after myself. You just stay there. Send the, send the child support checks when you can. If you can't, no problem. <laughs> let's continue i sincerely appreciate all of your support but please do not make threats spread hate or try to go out and locate him bro if this woman was black this message would be so much different she's so lovely if this is a black woman or latina woman or a latina woman like there would be violence like please bring your baseball bats please bring barbed wire please bring any weapons you may have no guns <laughs> um and we're going to convene at this one spot and we're going to go marching to his house and beat up anybody that we see, man, woman or child. Um, truly, I only want to see the situation resolved so me and my children can restart our lives and fix the damage done. That's the thing as well as the harshest part. It's the children, you know, the little bambinos, man, the little babies. At the end of the day, I get to come home to my babies and be their mum. So I think I win regardless. Exactly. Also, that karaoke video that everyone is sending, I did not think that was actually him. So I apologize to whoever it is for the karaoke being blasted over the internet. You did a great job, though. Thank you again for everyone. No, she seems fucking lovely. I'm sure there's probably loads of simps out there reaching out saying, look, I can be your stepdad. But yo, to go from this picture, you have to be a real piece of shit guy. To go from this beautiful wedding picture, right? And then to suddenly just leave your family and say you're going out for milk and never come back. You are a prime piece of shit. <laughs> your piece of shit levels are like astronomical. You deserve an award. You know, a bad award, but definitely an award because fucking hell oh my god look they were together together like of course so many pictures of them <laughs> so yeah um big up a uh, big up ashley big up fucking ashley big up motherfucking ashley we love to see it we love to see it we love to fucking see it so moving on I'm still not over this J. Cole thing. I'm not going to lie. I know it's a bit dumb to keep repeating it and to keep going down that lane, but I'm still not over it. And I think as a fan of J. Cole, it's, it's just super disappointing, you know? It's just super disappointing because, like I said previously, like for the last five years, let's say, he's definitely been on one of those bossy bossy like, I'm one of the best ever to do it people need to recognize i'm one of the best don't discount me look at my discography i've got hits i can rap better than you like he's been really letting his nuts hang and he had a really good run with some amazing features very unexpected you know from little yeah and all these other different people that he was jumping on tracks with and just absolutely dupping then he gets the chance to prove it when kendrick like it's not even a it's not even like a diss record read really to kendrick it's more so a diss record to drake but you know um what you called it j cole is like you know collateral damage and he gets a chance to kind of prove it which people weren't really calling for that's the thing that's funny it's not like fans were really pressuring j cole to reply back to kendrick it's more so drake because drake has avoided quite a bit of smoke from people and he's kind of waved the white flag he's become you know i didn't really like when he started crying about the push a t 40 lyric right about the 666 shit, right? He started getting really, you know, basically making it into be like, oh, he crossed the line type of things. Like, look, there's no, there isn't such thing as crossing the line in fucking, um, when it comes to battle and diss records. If you watch battle rap, you'll know, like, the most harshest, most horrible thing you can say to somebody is always the best. Um, especially if you can get you a win and kind of discombobulate your opponent and make him forget his bars and whatever. So it wasn't even that bad of a diss towards Kendrick, towards J. Cole. He also didn't need to reply. The pressure was mostly on Drake. But he does reply. Salute to him as a rapper, as an, as an MC. Fucking amazing. He then packages that reply in an EP before his album's about to drop, which is another level, right? Imagine, you don't only just put out the seven-minute drill, you put out also an EP, right? Might delete later. Fucking amazing. Then you hear it. It's a bit of a softy, softy thing. Jab, jab, jab. Not really anything really going on there to really kind of, you know, nothing really um, to really chew on. But he does kind of set up a premise of like, oh, let's question Kendrick's greatness, really. He does really well in that regard, in that verse. Let's sow some some seeds of discontent. Let's sow some seeds of confusion and make you really question, is Kendrick as good as you think he is? Love that. Love what he did there, right? 
And if you okay, cool, that's setting up for another round of records when Kendrick replies. Then two days later, he's like on stage saying he can't sleep. What? Like, I can't believe it. I really can't believe it. You're like, you're just astounded. Like, what the fuck is going on, J. Cole? You couldn't sleep over a diss record that wasn't even that harshly directed at you. Also, your diss to him wasn't even that harsh either. So it makes me think to me, myself, my, my only conclusion from this was this. I think J. Cole and most rappers just get up to so much shit behind the scenes that we don't know about that only people in the industry know about, record executives, other fellow artists and shit, industry heads, right? I think that that's what they're scared of. They're scared of that shit getting up because in the era of social media, where everybody has access to you 24 hours of the day, you have access to your fans 24 hours a day, you can share every part of your life 24 hours of the day. If you can get away with something, you're going to hold on to that ability to get away with it and that secret until your grave because everything else is on is in public. So if you can get away with it, you can get away with it. So I think that's what happened. And because J. Cole is immensely private, he didn't want anything getting out that he didn't put out himself, especially because, you know, he doesn't really share a lot of his personal life and whatever. And he kind of keeps himself to himself, even like society he doesn't really talk that much about things in terms of politics and shit. He kind of just minds his business, makes his music and keeps it moving. Right. So maybe that's what he was worried about. He was just worried about people finding out things about him that he never would tell us or the public or he never would share. That's what was really. So imagine throwing away your career as an MC throwing away your credit because you know as an artist he's fine i think most people who check for j cole's music don't care about this beef at all they just want the fall off to drop that's it but as a mc as a rapper his credibility is kapoop it's gone it's finished it's done it's finito so he's willing to risk losing his credibility as an mc which is wild because he's one of the best i would say he's probably the best rapper of the three personally for me um Maybe Kendrick has the performances and, you know, stage presence and live shows. Because I've seen Kendrick perform live. He's fucking phenomenal live. I guess Drake is probably the better all-round artist because he can do he can do everything, basically, right? He's a Swiss army knife in that respect. Even if you don't like his music, Drake is definitely able to do more stuff. Like, he can jump on grime, jump on pop, do the whole rapidly backpack rap stuff and shit, R&B. The other guys are a little bit maybe narrow. Um, and even the content of what he says. But there's no denying in my in my head, in my fucking position, that J. Cole hands down is the best rapper. Um, the best one that you want you want to listen to, right? Freestyles and verses, like just incredible. So for him to sacrifice that legacy of him being one of the best rappers ever, just because he's scared of people finding out that I don't know, you know, he likes to eat ass or he's into threesomes or maybe he cut whatever he's whatever people someone he would have said about him is fucking insane. It really is insane. Or the other side of things is that he's always just been a giant pussy. And when he was faced with up with competition and actually was challenged, he wilted and took his ball and went home. That's the other side of things. But I think this rant, actually the whole episode, the new recent episode that dropped at the moment um, of New Rory and More, I forgot what number episode it is actually. Let me actually check it here on my phone. But there's a recent episode of New Old Rory and More where Moore is in rare fucking form. This is probably one of the best Moore performances on a pod in a while. And it's really good as well because a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, just mainly fucking, fucking Danny from the stop, really, um, were questioning Moore's kind of, you know, place on the podcast and just in podcasting in general, saying he's too lackadaisical, he goes through the motions, he doesn't really give it up, he's too cool for school. But I like Mo. I think I like his presence on pods. I think he's a necessary person. I think it's nice to have somebody in the podcast world who doesn't want to engage in all the drama and nonsense, all the weird shit, and doesn't want to get in all the gossip and shit, and just likes to talk music and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and some and has his own point of view. And in this particular episode, episode number two five eight, he has a legendary rant about J. Cole and basically echoes a lot of my thoughts and says some other really funny stuff. But this is one of the clips that's really incredible and kind of gets across why a lot of J. Cole fans, myself included, are disappointed that he wasn't able to step up to the plate. This is um, more on J. Cole apologizing to Kendrick Lamar. This is what this is, bro. You can no longer do that. You can no longer say, yo, I'm the best. I'm better than all of y'all. Niggas gonna look around like, who are you talking to? We just, <laughs> nigga, you couldn't sleep for three days. You was, you, nigga, you was, you couldn't sleep. 
this is worse than Drake having tummy problems. This is the worst shit I've ever seen. This this is the worst shit I have ever seen in hip hop as far as just MCs like rapping. Indeed. This is the worst shit ever. So I'd what? had no bro, niggas was hitting me like, yo, is this real? <laughs> So I'm like, there's no night. way he said, he said, I thought he was lining it up to be like, so I thought he was going to say fuck psych out. and then drop perform. the record. <laughs> I thought he was going to be like, drop the record, nigga. I thought the second one was coming. I was waiting <laughs> to hear suck my dick. I was, I thought he was going there. I'm barking, I'm like, yo, he about to, he said the most, this ain't real. He about to kill us, nigga. We're going to get another record right here on the stream. That nigga went into love yours. I said, no, <laughs> you don't go into love yours after the beef. And that's the truth. And you know what's really sad about it too? Look at the face. That's fucking incredible. You know what's really sad about it too? Dreamville was fucking awesome. I watched some of the clips. The performances were sick, especially J. Cole's. He's really good live, man. Dreamville was really well produced, really well put together. I think he even announced on the stage that he doesn't really have many in him, which is odd because he hardly does anything. I don't have any more in me. This might be my last dream of it. It's like, come on, bro. Like, what does it mean? Is his last dream of performing or last dream of festival? Oh, it's like, bro, you do it once a year. Like, stop being fucking lazy. But the performance was fucking sick. Was really, really good. So that's what makes it really sad. Like, he had a really good performance. Um, I think a lot of people were hoping that he would bring out Drake to perform fucking, you know, um, what you call it? Um, first person shooter. That didn't happen, of course. And then here we are with J. Cole basically apologizing for you know, clapping back at Kendrick when Kendrick's been clapping at all of them, you know, ever since he popped up on the scene. Kendrick has made it very clear that he doesn't rate them all as fucking MTs and shit. So it's odd. It's a really bizarre thing. I really would love to know what the truth is of it, of the whole thing. Um, maybe it is, you know, he's suffering from his mental health shit. I don't really fucking know. Either way, I'm too disappointed and my heart is broken to be fair. I'm not going to lie. I love J. Cole. And to see him fucking refuse to compete is like, wow. Okay, cool, man. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. But it does explain a lot, though, especially when he's come to his absences. He just wants to kind of move to the beat of his own drum. He just wants to do his own thing. He doesn't want to be confined or restricted by the, you know, the whims and woes of fucking, you know, what you call it, the media and the industry and stuff. He just wants to do his own thing. His own thing is releasing music when he wants, doing shows when he wants, and popping out when he wants. That's it. He doesn't want to partake in anything else. So I get it, I guess. I get it. Disappointing, but I guess I get it. I guess I get it. Moving on, we got this news courtesy of RA regarding Peggy Goo is about to release a brand new album. Peggy Goo is about to release a brand new album called I Hear You. The funny thing about this, I have such weird main character syndrome. I'm such a fucking, you know, um, undiagnosed narcissist. I thought the title of the album had something to do with me. I thought for all the videos and all the commentary I've done on Peggy Goo over the years, I thought she said, I hear you. Like, hey, Agostino, I hear all the shit you've been talking. I hear all that rah rah thing you say on your pod about me and about my weird accent and all this stuff. And I'm coming. I'm coming, Agostino. I thought this the title of the album was something to do with me. That's how much of a fucking psycho I am. Obviously not. But still, it's coming out on June 7th for, on XR Recordings. Um, I'm assuming the album title has something to do with all the negative um, press and attention she gets online. People questioning her artistry, questioning whether or not she's a plant, questioning whether or not she's a nepo baby, questioning her background, questioning whether or not she has a ghost producer, all this malarkey. So I'm assuming these mirrors um, around her ears is basically her saying she hears all the naysayers. She hears everything you've been saying. Just listen to this album. So most likely this album would be I'll imagine, taste-wise, sonically, especially considering <clears throat> the singles are all over the place, that she's recently dropped from um, It Goes Na 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 and Lenny Kravitz, I believe, in Love Again, and obviously the new one, which is 1 plus 1 equals 11. I think this album's going to be like a showcase of her skills. She's like, look, I hear you. I hear all the naysayers. I hear you guys doubting my talent, doubting my fucking you know, place in the dance music industry. And I think this is going to be a compilation of some of the best of some of her taste so it's going to be everything from trance drum and bass house techno-ish sounding things edm disco um you know dance i tell her dance side records i think it's going to be across the board that's my theory i don't think it's going to be one genre i think she's going to display her musical talents throughout and i've also got a feeling this is a weird thing i'm going to throw out here i don't know why i think this but just something i'm just thinking i have a feeling she's going to put out some sort of content or video of her making a track from the beginning to the end because that's one of the things that's always been labeled at her right that she's a ghost producer because you think about um what's that legendary track that she had 
what's a legendary track that Peggy Goo had back in the day that was super I think it's Starry Night, I think if I'm thinking of, right? People basically say that the fall off from Starry Night and a few of the other records that she put out is proof that she didn't really produce that track. So Starry Night was made by a ghost producer and the other stuff that she's done has been her, which is why the quality of it hasn't been as good. I don't think that's the case. I just think sometimes you hit a lick. Sometimes when you get into music, the first thing that you make or the first major release that you put out that's got some backing and promotion behind it just takes off. It's not your fault. Do you know what I mean? It kind of is what it is. So maybe that stuff is what kind of happened when it came to her. So, the, you know, the earliest stuff that she put out dropped. People fucking loved it. And it ended up being, you know, pretty amazing for her. So people excuse her being having ghost producers. So I have a feeling this is a, a rumor without no regard and me just kind of shooting the shit here. She's going to put out some type of video where it kind of proves undeniably that she's the one that makes the records, where she crafts a song from the beginning. You see her, you know, laying down some of the early beats and bass lines and melodies and then slowly building up into a track itself. That's my feeling going forward. Again, I could be wrong, but that's my feeling. Um, so far from the singles that have dropped, the best one is definitely 1 plus 1 equals 11, followed by maybe Na Na Na. Na 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 I fucking hate. It's so annoying, but it also is kind of good. It's a weird record. Like it doesn't, it probably doesn't, it doesn't have a good shelf life, right? It's not something you want to hear again and again. I haven't, really, I haven't really even heard any good remixes of it, but decent enough. The I Believe in Love Again track with Lenny Kravitz, I don't get this. I'd love to know what the what the connection with her and Lenny Kravitz is. Did she bump into him at her Muay Thai gym? Did Do they, you know, were they in Bottega buying the same fucking leather pants? Were they fucking before? I don't know. Or did they bump each Like, what the deal is that? Because that, that track was so weird, so random, and so shit. Um, you can hardly hear Lenny Kravitz in it. And when he does come into it, he sounds horrendous. Like, I don't know. It's a really bad song. Um, but I feel like the 1 plus 1 equals 11 is really fucking good, especially the beatless version. Um, it's very trancey kind of record kind of in trend with what everyone's kind of listening to at the moment um you know it's very uh, it's, it's what you describe as a quintessential big room record i think it's gonna go off in festivals it's gonna go off in drum sheds and all those kind of five thousand capacity soulless venues which is gonna be good i guess for her in terms of you know earning some money on streams and shit and just getting your name out there um but i'm eager to see what else she has on there i'm eager to see if there's gonna be like an r&b record or something right or like a really cool synth pop record but i have a feeling she's gonna really go and kind of prove the doubt was wrong and have a compilation of all the different sounds on the album now the only negative will be that it might be so good people will still question whether or not she did it you know what i mean that's what might happen um let's continue here the quote from her says i hear you is more than just a debut album it embodies countless hours of dedication in my journey to create something timeless and is a testament to the power of listening to ourselves and each other that's an amazing paragraph that says nothing but uses a lot of words she's very good at like sounding like you know like a legit artist that you have to give peggy goo that that rating like she come you know she carries herself like a pro because that sounds amazing but i don't really know what that means you know but let's continue south africa south african the south korean artist has typically stacked touring schedule in place in the coming months highlights include coachella so let's actually see where is she playing actually where is it oh it's got a track list as well there where is she actually playing is she booked and busy let's see peggy goo and ra is she booked and busy bloody hell she's not doing any small you can tell she's making bank in it because every flyer that's on here on ra on the ra page right ra.co um ra.co forward slash dj forward slash peggy you on my word it's all festivals massive flyers with like loads of tiny names on the first on the on the lineups no small club the only thing that's kind of small lineup wise is the thing that she's doing in gunnery park which is quite a good lineup to be fair it's a really random lineup but it's quite a good one um peggy goo 17th of august on saturday here in london in gunnery park special guests include mochak lsdxo sally c and hiver none of these people i've read mochak lsdxo sally c and hiver have anything in common apart from knowing how to use pioneer cdjs musically they're all completely different even with the way they look the way they dress their friends they're all completely different people so to have all these people in one lineup is fucking wild um so it's either going to be really good or it's going to be a fucking horror show but that's the only lineup i can see that's got you know a, a normal sized lineup everything else is like just hundreds of people so imagine all of these gigs like let's say her booking fee is like a hundred grand or like i don't know imagine she's gonna be making bank this summer and the album's dropping in between this time so the album drop it'll probably go number one 
and then it'll end up she will end up getting way more dates on the back of that as well. But she's doing a lot of dates in England actually. So Coachella on on the on Friday the um, April twelfth, um then she's got EDC the following month in Las Vegas. Then Primavera Sound in May. I wish I was going this year. One of my favorite festivals of all time. Primavera Sound. Oh, and Vampire Week. Oh, my God. The lineup of Primavera Sound is fucking incredible for this small flyer. Vampire Weekend, Charlie XCX, J. Paul, Deftones, Omar Apollo, Peggy Who Have Troy Sivan. Oh, my God. The lineup of, for fucking Primavera is absolutely amazing. Anyway, let me stop looking at that. Um, She's going to be at Primavera Sound. She's also going to be at We Love Green Festival in Paris. And then loads of England dates. Rockstar Energy Drink presents Park Life. Fucking hell, look at the name of these festivals. Rockstar and City. This is why people hate festivals, isn't it? The corporatization of festivals is fucking crazy. Um, Manchester, she's playing in Glastonbury, um, then back in London, then she's back playing Creamfields, then playing Emerge in Belfast. So a lot of UK dates, actually. But yeah, what's her booking fee? Probably like 100 grand. Let's see if everyone, anybody knows. What is Peggy Goo's booking fee? Peggy Goo booking fee. I'd imagine it's going to be like a hundred grand, or maybe is it, or, or is it ten grand? Oh, really? Thirty k. This is oh, this is for something to do with Beatport. Has got anything here? Anybody got any information of how much she charges? Any person here? Let's see. No one's saying anything. Um, booking. Uh, book, pay you booking. How? I see. How much does Peggy you? Yeah, let's see. How much did you get paid? Two million. A DJ producer, a fashion icon, Peggy Goo has carved out a unique niche for herself. Oh, this is a list of it. The highest paid techno DJ. Let's see this. Via technoairlines.com. The highest pay She's not even techno, to be fair. I love how they just use the term techno just to describe electronic music, but she's definitely not techno. She's probably more house than she is techno. Do you know what I mean? It makes no sense here. So let's see here. Um, the, oh, shit. The number one. Net worth DJ is Carl Cox, 60 million. Sven Vaar is 40. Ra, I didn't know he was that high up. Sven Vaar is like, he's actually done pretty well in that. Yes, he's obviously super commercial, but he's also kind of remained. He's also, he's, he's still got a bit of that underground appreciation. I feel like if he was to pop up at like a smaller venue and play, people would be hyped to see him. Like if he played at Panorama Bar or something or Bergheim, people, people would want to see him play. Do you know what I mean? I don't think he's, I don't think he's that lame as other people. Like he's not, you know what I mean? Like a Marcel Dietman, I think maybe has probably lost it because he's probably doing a lot too many of these type of things. But I don't know. Amelia Lenz to be on there, considering how young she is, is fucking phenomenal too, by the way. She's number three, 10 million net worth. And she's way younger than Carl Cox and Sven Vaz. So that's fucking crazy. She'd probably be their daughter. Deborah DeLuca, the one that everyone hates with the big lips, she's on there. Adam Bayer, who I despise, he's on there. Nina Kravitz, 2.5, Peggy Goof, 2. There's a lot of women on this list, isn't it? They say, oh, there's not a lot of women in DJing, but of the 10 here with the highest net worth, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are women. That's really good. It's come a long way, to be fair. It's come a long way, let's be honest. Yes, a lot of them are the same old names, but it's still pretty encouraging, to be fair. It's still pretty encouraging. So big up Peggy Goo on that regard. Let's check her fucking Instagram. What's she been up to lately? What's this? What's what's big pegs have been up to? Obviously just looking fabulous and wearing all the. She's always got the latest best shit in it. Look at this picture with the fucking latest patter. I think that's the patter jacket, right? The varsity jacket that um patter did. I think LeBron James wore it recently. Is it patter? Yeah, it is patter. Look at that. The latest patter jacket. Of course she's got that straight. She gets. She must get the best seating. Her seating must be fucking incredible. Incredible, like full fucking DJ setup in her in her house. I love this. This is actually quite cool. I love how that her DJ booth setup in her house is like the decks are there inside this nice little cube design thing, and then it's mirrored. Might be a bit weird looking at itself, but it's quite cool. I like how it's mirrored because that's something I've always been annoyed by when I have my decks at home. It's like it's facing a wall. Yes, it's just a MIDI player, but it's just like a wall. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, the mirror thing is quite cool. I quite like that. Um, yeah, just living life in it lovely you can no wonder daniel wang was upset about her isn't it? and was kind of jealous because daniel wang has been in the industry for so long he's such a respected amazing dj and then to be like you know asian as well to think there's some solidarity between you guys she moves into the same building as you she then lives at the top floor allegedly and then her apartment looks like this fucking hell like you know what i mean she's got literal handlers taking up her shopping upstairs she doesn't even carry things she doesn't even carry her own headphones probably right probably has somebody with a little pouch a little patter dj bag that brings her headphones and a usb to her while she's about to play 
Life of Peggy Goo must be so good, man. It must be so good. Look at the house. It's so fucking lovely. Is that Futura? Little finger at the back there. Oh, no, it's not. It's a scorpion. I thought she had a little random Futura thing. Okay, cool. There we go. And then what's the other picture, too? There's a, I see a guy here. Is, is this like a boyfriend or something? Who's who's, who's this guy? Oh, that, oh, that's Olo. Oh, that's the guy that did the collaboration. Okay, cool. And there's matching jackets, too. So, yeah. She's doing, she's doing, she's doing way for herself, as you can see. How many followers? 4.1 million. Just living life, man. Just, you know, lo amazing clothes. Great location. Out here hanging out with fucking Son from Tottenham. Korean pride there. Nice to see. Fuck me. What a fucking life. Let's see some videos. Let's see, Ash. Let's see. What, what's the video where she... Look at that crowd. What, what crowd has she played in front of there? In Argentina, Buenos Aires. Cool, man. Cool, isn't it? Cool. What's the fee, I'm thinking? What would she get? I'm thinking 100 cat because I think the last time I checked, I think Solomon was getting... In that article for The Atlantic, it said he was getting somewhere around 100K. I think that was for like a season, though, when he first started. I wonder if she's able to break 100K per booking. That's wild, but that might be online. Maybe it's 100k per booking. That's incredible. I, I love the setup, all the screens around it, and all the artwork. That's a pretty cool um, experience. I think that's what you have to do if you're going to be a DJ that plays these big events, and you only play these massive, huge events. You know, ten thousand plus people, festivals, open air, and shit. You have to put on a bit of a show. Like you have to put on a nice audio visual com component that makes it worthwhile to kind of see you. The only thing I don't like, to be fair, and it's something that I have to give Burkheim a lot of credit for, I hate the stage culture shit. I hate all this stuff. I despise everyone standing around a booth. The only good thing they've done here, from what I can see, this is like a VIP section. So the VIP section is at the top. Um, the booth around her is, you're not allowed to go in there, but you can stand around. That's a VIP thing. Cool. But I think, in general, there should be a separation. If you're the DJ playing, you should be playing up there on your own. There should be no one else on stage there, apart from yourself or maybe your boyfriend or something. But there should be no one else. I don't like this whole thing. I think it's annoying and distracting. And, and if you're raving, it kind of takes away, it kind of distracts you. You're not paying attention to the rave because then you're seeing people, you know, oh, she's hot. Or who's that, who's that guy taking a bump? Do you know what I mean? It's really distracting. But um, I love this. That looks really cool. I'm not going to lie. That looks really fucking cool. More smoke, more sick stuff. What's the, what's the, what's the gene say? Rest and re, what's that? Rest and wreck routine. I don't know, something. I don't know what that says. I don't want to zoom into a bump too much. And then, of course, let's play a video and see what she plays when she's out recently. What's this one? What's this one about? Let's see. What's this one say? Look up, look up, look at F F K A M four A. He's definitely he knows that his bread's buttered. I think she did well there by bringing him in. I think she helped put you know put him on a few shows and boost his signal, which you don't see a lot of DJs do. I don't, I've always wondered that as well. I've kind of spoken about this on the pod sometimes as well. In the DJ world, it's not like hip hop and shit where people will put their arm around a DJ and kind of bring them in. It's always just like you know everyone for themselves so it's nice to see her basically extend her hand and use her fame to kind of prop up somebody else and now fka m4a is booked and busy and doing his own thing as well so congrats to them congrats to them eager to see the album when it eventually does drop um peggy goo um what you call it i hear you lp about to drop in june on june 7th and of course i'm definitely going to do a live reaction to this i'll probably do a live re album reaction to this on probably kick so if you haven't followed me already make sure you follow me on my kick my kick is should be kick.com forward slash agostino zinger so if you want to follow me on there do so because i'm definitely going to do a live reaction to that and play it in full on kick when that track on that lp eventually does drop so definitely make sure you follow me on kick for all of your music needs and shit you see it there on the profile i'll also put it in the link description if you want to check it out that's my fucking kick profile over there nice and easy nice and blood clot easy you know how it is you know how it is let's move on so we've got that so um this is an interesting video right this is courtesy of the we might be drunk podcast it features mark norman i forgot the other guy's name and obviously ari is his guest and they share this anecdotal story about lex friedman it's interesting because Lex Friedman purports himself to be the love guy, purports himself to be the kindness guy, all this sort of malarkey, right? Very, very soft-spoken, quiet type of dude, right? Um, butter wouldn't melt or whatever. 
But people have always hypothesized that underneath all that fucking vignette of fucking naivete and, you know, sincerity and shit is a very rageful guy, right? Somebody that would duppy somebody if need be. And I think this video is proof that the whole charade of like, I love this and I love everybody thing is a charade. Because look at what Mark Norman said about Lex Friedman and how he acts in real life. This is really surprising, but also not surprising when I initially heard this clip. And if I remember correctly, I think they did clip this and put this up on their highlights channel. Then they took it down. So I'm assuming Lex Friedman probably reached out to them and said, hey, you know, please, no. But listen to this clip. This is from the podcast, We Might Be Drunk, Mark Norman's podcast with the other dude, I forgot his name. Um, listen to what they say about um, Lex Friedman and how he is in person, in real life. How did she get these names? Like I, I she had. Did, she did a uh, Glassman's podcast. They, they had that exact sense of humor, and then just like right, exactly. And it was like big, and but then it's Drake. But I was so. big and new, just like everybody likes Huberman. Everybody like Lex Friedman. Everyone's like, oh, I'm gonna invite him to my wedding. I'm like you didn't even know it existed four months ago. <laughs> <laughs> what the I fuck are we talking? He gets about? Elon Musk. He gets Tucker uh -huh. Carlson. He gets Rogan. He gets all these giant names, and he's just like an MIT robot. Yeah. <laughs> But nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> I did the pod. He was nice. Good teacher. Really seems to care. <laughs> <laughs> you did his pod. It was fun. It was super fun. Yeah, he just asked good questions. He's yeah, a smart dude. Fuck, are they, oh, you autistic doffed. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> hey, both your own versions of autism. <laughs> <laughs> you had a yeah, you're the most German autism ever. Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> it did make you seem fucking normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got to do, I think. Yeah, you hang out with that dude. Exactly. Yeah. Compared to him, I was like a, uh, you know, he's your like, armor. he's your like, if you're a seven chick and and you hang out with a four. That's your it. Four. <laughs> That's for, for socialization. Well, what's fun is uh, I he we did it in a hotel in New York. He was in town for some reason and the printer wasn't working in the lobby and i got to watch him yell at the the lady behind the desk and that was weird seeing him not be that robot guy he was like what the hell the printer doesn't work get your shit together and some girl like i, I don't know <laughs> see how mad that is the funny thing about that is that rogan and a few other people have this common line they always trot out like you know one of the lines they say oh there's only a thousand great comedians in the world um um, be the hero of your own story. All these sort of like, you know, anecdotal phrases they all always throw out. And one of the things they always say is that you should always treat servers nice, isn't it, right? It's like a thing that they kind of pride themselves on, right? Treating like service industry people well, like not getting angry, not being a dickhead and basically saying, oh, you can judge a lot about somebody by how they treat a service industry person. I think it also extends in dating. I've heard somebody, people say in dating, I've heard people say in dating, like if you're a woman and you're going out with a guy, there's a suggestion that you should always try and have the first date in a very public venue where there's a lot of random people around to see how they navigate around, like maybe a busy bar, busy restaurant to see how they deal with that situation. So you can probably tell a lot about that person's character and how they are, personality, by how they kind of, you know, deal with maybe having to wait a bit longer for the table, maybe getting bumped by somebody going to the toilet, maybe a bartender taking too long, you can tell. So all that being said, these guys pride themselves on being such great guys who tip the most to service industry workers who are always a pleasure to be around and all of these cafe people that are working in Starbucks are happy to see them all sort of sort of shit. But the truth is, Lex Friedman is out here barking at hotel receptionists when the hotel when the hotel printer don't work. He probably does this quite often. He probably does because, you know, most of his podcasts, he records them in like these lavish rooms and shit with black curtains around him. So probably that's what he likes to do. You'll fly into a city, major one, and just like, you know, post up and probably bang out a few podcasts and record them back to back in hotel rooms. But you'd imagine he'd have a bit of patience because hotels, you know, especially people that work at the front desk, they have a million things to kind of look after and uh, things to deal with. It's not like you, you are their only fucking one concern. And stuff like printers, stuff like envelopes no so sort of like getting mail delivered there stuff like maybe whatever you you could you could extend them a bit of grace because it's not things that are like an immediate necessary concern yes it's nice if you can, can get something printed out at the fucking hotel printer but most common people a regular person sensible person practical person if you actually didn't need something to be printed you just find your local kinkos or something right or a local print shop in the area and just go and get printed and usually in areas where they're hotels you, you, you probably could find a print shop not too far around so if you did need to print something you could or if if that if it's that necessary and again lex freeman's making so much money in his fucking pod anyway why don't you just bring a printer with you 
you're already bringing fucking you know red cameras you're bringing fucking you know um sure smb sevens and shit you know you're bringing mic stands you're bringing fucking you know big fucking box lights if you can bring all that stuff why not just bring a printer with you so that you can print to your heart's content so to hear lex friedman is the type of person to be barking at a fucking hotel reception this is just trying to do a job makes a lot of sense because underneath that vignette of like oh i'm just a naive guy i don't really know what i'm doing is a rage filled person like it's all of it's all a hoax it's all a it's all a ruse um, and i think we've all kind of we can sense the insincerity of it i think that's why people call him out i think that's why he's you know a person that's so quick to block i think even i might be blocked from him which i don't which is really wild because i don't directly talk about anybody I will never tag somebody if I'm going to say something. I'll just write what I write. So most likely somebody searching for his name and seeing people that he that you know say not anything mean and just blocking because he believes in like blocking with love or something. Some sort of stupid addict thing. I think I remember him saying where he's not able to kind of receive any kind of you know um what you call it negative or contradictory you know basically opposing constructive strict strict criticism content or feedback back his way. But he's also the kind of person that will bark and shout at a fucking hotel receptionist. So it's more proof if ever you needed it that that you know when people are when people go overboard to be like you know to signify that they're a great person that they're a lovely person usually is hiding something sinister. Um, and I think that you know the uh, what you got the same could be said for um who's that rapper that recently got divorced? He made that album about loving his wife, and then you know a few months or you know a couple of years later he's divorcing his wife. It's like yeah, the guys who are always out there like trying to overly prove to the internet that they're the best husbands in the world are usually the ones doing their partners the worst at home. Do you know what I mean? That's usually the truth of it, unfortunately so. But yeah, not surprised to hear Lex Friedman's a bit of a cunt in real life. Not surprised to hear that Lex Friedman is a bit of a cunt in real life. I'm not surprised to hear that he's a bit of a cunt. And then I'm going to quickly play this video as well. This is courtesy of a creator called Dicey Dicey. They put together this video called, Is Lex Friedman a Fraud? I didn't actually watch this. So I actually want to see what this was about because I wanted to see um, if there was anything else on here that I kind of missed when it comes to Lex Friedman and some of his kind of, you know, fraudy ways. So let's actually see what this content creator was talking about when it comes to Lex Friedman. This is courtesy of a channel called Dicey Dicey. Let's see what I go on. Go back to the start is closer to a book club students have the option of taking one class like i'm a total bro in a, in a sense like like i'm a total bro in a, in a sense like i may not look like it but i'm i'm very i have like have you ever said that in your entire life have you ever said i'm a total bro in some sense i don't think i've ever uttered a sentence like that ever in my entire life i'm a total bro what only a non-bro would say they're a total bro <laughs> <laughs> i'm kind of like a ladies man you know i'm kind of like an alpha <laughs> i'm kind of like a funny guy you know what like a rogan inside me i really am a man's yuck i'm like i've got a rogan in why not why not say your dad i've got a rogan inside of me and how old is lex anyway isn't he like rogan's age or is he is he one of those guys that's got like a really old face but he's super young how how actually old is he he's 40 years old and he acts like rogan's he's like he sucks up to, he could easily be rogan's brother but he sucks up to him like he's rogan's his dad what a weirdo what a bizarre guy man except for the times in like harvard square and academia rubs off on me uh, but for the most part, man's man. What does a man's man mean? May I? There's just a list of stupid shit you do. Like I like lifting heavy things. <laughs> I like building stuff. I like. I love the idea of hunting. I, I love fishing. I like knives and guns and risk. He literally sounds like he's LARPing as a male. Ah yes, I like lifting heavy things. I also like knives and guns. Therefore, I'm a man's man. So and dumb. you better respect my authority. So as you know by now, this video is about Alexei Fedotov, more commonly known as Lex Friedman. Lex is a researcher and podcaster that has gained quite a bit of popularity in the last few years. I came across Lex through social media clips of him with Joe Rogan, Elon Musk, and a lot of other prominent folks. So even before I knew anything about him, he had an aura of legitimacy solely because he associated 
associated with wildly successful people. But ever since I saw this guy, something just didn't feel right about him and I couldn't pinpoint it. So when I was digging around on topics for my next video, I finally decided to dive into the Lex Friedman rabbit hole and there was a lot of questionable things I found about the guy. For example, he portrays himself to be someone more than he actually is, he has deliberately created an image that does not necessarily correspond to reality, and he is simply misleading people. Many of his fans believe that he is or was a professor at MIT or studied at MIT, which is the MIT thing has been one of his greatest scams. I swear to God, it's like I've always wondered, like maybe I should use the fact that I went to Central St. Martins way more in my content, way more in my personality to sort of brand myself. But I also, as somebody like maybe it's just my ego, I don't want anyone to take credit for anything that I do apart from me. So I wouldn't want anyone to be like associate me with going to this illustrious fucking art college and art university, right? That's hard to get into to, 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 to kind of signify that I'm also an amazing artist. No, I want to be an amazing artist on my own. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Off my own back without the fucking backing of that. So if it, if it was me and I was a scientist, I wouldn't want to be associated with MIT anyway. I'd kind of run away from it. I wouldn't even want to, you know, if people brought it up, I'd be like, yeah, I went. And it'd be one of those kind of anecdotal things that people find out, like, oh shit, did you know that this guy went to MIT? But I'd want to be well regarded in the field of science because of my scientific discoveries, because of my scientific research, right? Because of the things that I've done. But Lex Friedman did a really good job of branding himself as an MIT. Like he basically branded himself more as an MIT guy than anybody else I've ever seen. Like when you think of MIT, weirdly enough if you listen to podcasts you think of lex friedman that's how fucking well he did it and from what i'm let's understand he did like one guest lecture there right during some sort of summer school program or something and that's it he wasn't even like an actual you know research scientist there he didn't actually he wasn't like a legit teacher there or anything it's just a funny thing how he's able to take that one nugget of truth and kind of stretch it out into this whole brand and identity so you know it's a smart con it's a smart grift i'm not gonna lie isn't true. A lot of his academic accolades are exaggerated or misrepresented. He's also a Tesla shill and more specifically an Elon Musk shill. He was kicked out of the MIT Age Lab group for his non-peer-reviewed report chilling for Tesla's self-driving capabilities. But I think his biggest crime is that he's boring and cringy. He robotically asks the same handful of naive questions and gets weirdly emotional and defensive about random topics from time to time. Like he has this shtick where he talks slow in order to make himself seem more articulate, but all it does is make him seem disingenuous. You know what's funny that I've also not liked? Because I remember Tim, this is the thing, Tim Ferriss, big up Tim Ferriss, big up the four hour work week, big up the four hour body. I'm a big fan. Tim Ferriss has always been my guy. That's been a person who I think I can credit with my perspective on the world or my perspective on life and about my, you know, insistence on kind of doing my own thing and having your own muse and being able to kind of, you know, do things on your own schedule and live in be location dependent. He's basically, he's the one that kind of introduced me to like, you know, um, freelancing or you know having your own brand whatever that kind of word that whole world yeah before even kind of covid came about but tim Ferriss got a really bad rap because of his book the four hour work week right the four hour work week is this book here the four hour i'm sure some of you guys have read it i i, I read it religiously when it first dropped i read it cover to cover i bought loads and gave to friends and shit like this was to me like when it came out illegitimately i'm not gonna lie change my life right and the blurb says the four hour work week escape the nine to five live anywhere and join a new rich in a self-help book by tim ferris and the idea behind this was quite simple the idea behind it was like hey let's construct a system a brand a, a business whatever that you can automate that could allow you to only work four hours a week so you have more time in the week to do the things that you enjoy but i think because of the title the four hour work week it made it sound like Tim Ferriss was selling a program of how to make a business that only required four hours of work. And obviously you got shit on. People taking a piss saying, oh, he's, he's, he's a charlatan. There's no business that you can run. That only needs four hours of work per week. You have to invest all your time, blah, blah, blah. But that's not what he was saying. He was saying, hey, what's the minimal viable business that you could launch that doesn't require much of your input that you can only do for four hours that you can maybe commit to maximum of four hours per week so you can then do the things that you enjoy whether it's raising your kids whether it's you know learning some new stuff and going back to education that was the whole premise behind it It was about kind of freeing up your time and when i was working when i was in retail that's why i, I love the book because it kind of let me dream of a world where i was free of the constraints of having to work full time because the one thing i always hated about having to work especially when you worked in retail or worked in the service industry there was no days off during the year and you didn't get any public holidays apart from christmas so you worked all year all, all week round sometimes and some places if you worked 
they had a rota where it was like Sunday to Sunday. So sometimes it felt like you didn't have a day off, depending on how your your rota was done. If the week is done Sunday to Sunday, it can sometimes feel like you don't have a day off. It almost feels like a continuous kind of like going to work every single day. And it felt annoying. And obviously you commit a lot of your hours to them because you're working in a shop. Well, like I was working, I was working retail. I worked at like Dr. Martin's, Nike, Adidas stores, all these type of places. And these businesses in, you know, really busy areas, they're open from like 8 a.m. in the morning until like 9 sometimes. So your whole day is gone. So you don't really have time to do anything else outside of it. So I always felt like I was trapped and my time was being fucking, you know, was being kidnapped and I couldn't do anything else. So when I read this book, it allowed me to dream. Now, after he transitioned writing these books, Tim Ferriss got into like investing. He did a lot of like stuff like that, which was really cool. And then he got into being a bit of a businessman that way. But then he started to do his podcast, which was really popular too, the Tim Ferriss podcast. And the Tim Ferriss podcast got a lot of stick because he would just interview loads of famous people, right? In the startup world, right? He would do a lot of interviews with people and the, 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 the stick with him, and I think even Brendan Schaub said it one time, right? Was, ah, oh, he doesn't listen to people who just interview other smart people. But the thing is, he's actually a startup guy. Like he was involved in several startups. He's been in the industry for a while. Um, you know, he wrote one of the most influential books in startup industry. So it wasn't like he was just interviewing smart people to appear smart. He was actually a practitioner. Like he had some skin in the game. Now I say all that to say, Lex Freeman, the reason why I've never really warmed to him is that he only is that guy that interviews really smart people, um, really interesting people on his podcast. But then for some reason, that gives him like credibility. I never understood that. It's like, what have you actually done though? Yes, you have a successful podcast, but what have you actually done? Where are your expertise? You know what I mean? None. He just interviews interesting people. It's like, that shouldn't be it. That shouldn't put you in the in the in the that shouldn't put you in the same category as the person you're interviewing because you interview them. It doesn't now suddenly make you a fucking physicist. It doesn't now suddenly make you a fucking entrepreneur. No, what have you actually done? And he hasn't done anything apart from set up some mics and you know and sit in a room you know covered with black curtains. In my opinion, but again, maybe I'm hating. So sit tight and maybe buckle in while we discuss all things Lexi. And if you do enjoy this video, please be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. If you know anything about Lex, then you know that he always refers to himself as Lex Friedman, MIT research scientist, at every opportunity. But what he always fails to mention is that he wasn't even educated there or in any way employed by the university. What he did do there was that he taught a January term class, which isn't as impressive when you realize anybody can give presentations at MIT. So hold on, he taught a fucking summer school, Ben. He went there during like a... Oh my god, bro. I thought he did like a little period or something. So he did a, a summer class. Like a TED talk at MIT, basically, kind of like a presentation. But then he uses that as like, he's a, prof oh my God, Lex, come on, bro not just professors. A January term class is closer to a book club. Students have the option of taking one class that interests them during this term or staying home and coming back for the spring semester. It's basically a free form month for knowledge sharing. During that period, anyone can put together a call and anyone who wishes to attend, MIT affiliated or not, can attend. Oh, and it's all not for credit. Here's a- By the way, I love, I love how everyone shat on him. The reason why he got shat on a lot, remember recently, because he thought he could, he could fucking end the war in Ukraine by having Zelensky and Putin sit down on his podcast for an interview. You thought the podcast was going to end the war. <laughs> what a fucking, honestly. But somebody as smart as he is, he can be a bit stupid sometimes. Here's a quote from an actual person from MIT. It states, I've come across a handful of people in the last few years that figured out how easy it is to become vaguely affiliated with MIT. Then they use the university email and some spin to their affiliation and all of a sudden they've gotten a bunch of new opportunities and it only builds from there. People within academic circles will know the difference but outside, not necessarily. Lex definitely raises some red flags on this front. The dude randomly requested me on LinkedIn four or five years ago, and I saw we had a lot of MIT mutual connections. At the time, he was teaching. It's not difficult at all to organize a January term class. Many undergraduates even do this, but most don't use it to claim that they are a lecturer at MIT. Lex actually studied at Drexel University, which is a good but lower ranked university. His father is also a professor there, but he never mentions Drexel, and if you bring it up in his sub and ask him about it, you get banned. You will also get banned if you constructively criticize him or any of his guests he is a research scientist at mit but it it's amazing how thin-skinned he is isn't it it's amazing how thin-skinned lex is 
He doesn't like any constructive criticism, any feedback whatsoever, zero. You get blocked at the slightest bit of like pushback. Block, 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 block. Banned from the subreddit. It's like, fucking hell, bro. Relax. Literally, literally lives in a bubble. Literally lives in a bubble. It's almost impressive how he does it, to be fair. It is an unpaid position, and he has never been a professor. He purposefully allows the misconception to propagate because it benefits him to have people assume his science is better than it is. Another fun tidbit is that if you look at his LinkedIn profile, he has math functions in the back, which seems to be a theme. Like here's him standing in front of a classroom, again, with some math functions on the blackboard. But here's the thing, those functions have nothing to do with the class that he's teaching. The things on the blackboard were there from another class before his. What a genius though, to be fair though, it's a grift but... It's a good grift, isn't it? From the black, from the from the black suit, with the white shirt and the black tie, like that is it's an incredible grift. Because on paper he looks apart, you know, like fucking hell, mate. The talented Mr. Ripley, isn't it? The talented Mr. Friedman, fucking hell. And I know this because you can watch some of his lectures on his YouTube channel. But he keeps the math and purposefully includes them whenever he can to make himself seem smarter than he actually is. Even his LinkedIn page is misleading. He also claims on LinkedIn that he worked at Google for one year. It reads Google Researcher 2014 wow. to 2015. However, the tr truth is that he worked there as a visiting researcher for less than four months. Jesus Christ. In 2019, Lex Friedman released a study in which he claimed that contrary to a mountain of literature about human-machine interaction, drivers using autopilot remain vigilant and attentive. For this next part, I'll be referencing an insider article written by Julia Black, as it does well to capture the full picture of what happened and has some great resources to back it up. The article states, Though Friedman has touted affiliations with MIT and Google, AI and machine learning experts who spoke with insiders said Friedman lacks the publications, citations, and conference appearances required to be taken seriously in the hyper-competitive world of academia. When AI professionals on Twitter challenged Friedman's research methods for the Tesla study, he blocked them en masse. Soon after the study was published, Friedman moved his prestigious MIT lab to an unpaid research role. A former H lab staffer recalled Friedman telling him that he wanted to amass a giant amount of followers. Philip Piknewski, a computer vision and AI researcher who became one of Friedman's most vocal critics, said it was clear from the very beginning that he's positioned himself to become one of the celebrities in this space. The MIT seal of approval was likely enormously valuable to Tesla. Its autopilot feature had come under intense scrutiny over several widely publicized fatal crashes involving Tesla vehicles. The company was hit with a class action lawsuit that described autopilot as essentially unusable and demonstrably dangerous. But Musk insisted that his technology did not require human intervention, going so far as to brand the feature autopilot instead of copilot. Academics Actually, speaking of speaking of Teslas, Robo taxis are about to be announced soon. I think he did an announcement recently, and I think the next um, presentation for Tesla, I think it might be August or something. Allegedly, there's going to be a presentation of robo taxis, and it's a completely different car. So it's not just like a Model Three or something they've got it. It's going to be a completely different shape um, of a vehicle. So I think they're going to probably make it so that you know it's basically done to maximize space, so people, can, most people can kind of sit in there and jump in and shit. So I'm going to be curious to see what happens because I'm actually surprised how difficult autonomous driving has been for companies to solve. Like, it's it's really difficult to get right. Like, no one is really... But I guess maybe because of risk is involved too. If you don't if you don't get it right and people die, you know, the, the stain on that in your company is basically going to end it. Like, all it takes is one fatal accident and it's still over, which is dumb because people have fatal accidents all the time driving their car. So, um, it's, you know, even if, um, even if, um, autopilot or what you call it, autonomous driving is able to reduce fatalities on a road by like 5%, the fact that they still fatalities caused by autopilot is going to make people nervous and investors are not going to want to invest. But I'm actually shocked to see how difficult it's been to actually get it right. And AI began to pick apart the study's methodology. They criticized the small sample size and suggested the participants likely performed differently because they knew they were being observed, a phenomenon known as the Hawthorne effect. Missy Cummings, a former MIT professor who served as a senior advisor for safety at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, has called the report deeply flawed. What happens is people like Elon Musk take this and then try to make a big deal about it and say, I've got science on my side. I personally do not consider Lex a serious researcher, Cummings recently told Insider. When Anima Anand 
Kumar, a well-known AI expert, tweeted in 2019 that Friedman ought to submit his work for peer review before seeking press coverage. Friedman blocked her and many of her <laughs> colleagues, some of whom had never even engaged in the discussion. Amazing. Friedman did not respond to several interview requests and requests for comment. He told the historian Dan Carlin during one episode, journalists annoy the hell out of me. So I understand from Putin's perspective that journalism, yeah. journalists can be seen as the enemy of the state. Many that's the funny thing, isn't it? They're all, they're all basically supposed bastions of free speech, anti-cancel culture. But then when you criticize or push back against their ideas, they don't want to hear it. Like Rogan's a good example. He doesn't really open himself up to debates. He says what he says. He doesn't really like people kind of correcting him, really. He doesn't really take it too well and people do correct him. And doesn't really try to get people that have opposing views to him um, on his show too often. So, and Lex is even worse. Lex doesn't even engage. He just blocks acts like it doesn't exist and keeps on keeping on and a lot of it is like reasonable pushback and criticism that he should probably clap back at because if you think about it if he could disprove a lot of these claims it will make himself look way more credible than before so all the stuff that he's doing to pretend like he's credible with the you know loose associations with mit that he's exaggerating and making more of if he was actually able to counter and you know explain his reasonings for certain things that he did and get people on his side it would actually make him look more legit so it's actually in his benefit to try to do that but he doesn't he just blocks you any of Friedman's peers had another reason to be suspicious of the study. Friedman's admiration for Tesla CEO was well documented. He was an active participant in Tesla fan forums. He'd been photographed with Musk's boring company Flamethrower, and in a 2018 tweet that's since been deleted, he asked Musk to collaborate on a fully autonomous cross-country drive. Musk had even tweeted about Friedman's Tesla-friendly research in the past. One former MIT colleague of Friedman said many people in their field believed that being closely associated with Musk could be a career boon. Lex was relatively excited to get into touch with Elon Musk and get into his good graces. To be fair though, he did well for himself. He's best friends with Rogan and Musk. It's pretty good people to have in your corner. You know what I mean? He was never going to fail. Because I remember an early episode of like the T of Rogan, he, when he was not making a lot of money, I remember he was complaining about how he only just eats burgers from McDonald's. Like he basically eats keto and he gets his steak from like burgers from McDonald's. He was buying like one pound double, you know, hamburgers and shit taking off the bun and just using that as protein fucking bizarre to admit that you know you're eating like that in your 30s but that's what he did and then of course soon after i'm assuming that you know rogan appearance a couple of good guests and suddenly he's making b -b 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 bank you know he must make like probably 10 grand plus a month on youtube adsense alone forget all the sponsors and shit so yeah he's done well for himself associated with rogan and lex and, and sorry and um, elon has been a really smart thing in his part said the former colleague, who asked to remain anonymous to avoid professional repercussions. It's fair to say that his plan worked because two weeks after releasing the study, he got invited to do a podcast with Elon Musk and then later went on to be invited to Joe Rogan. Since then, his wow. podcast has really boomed, so his career definitely benefited, but his academic integrity, not so much. Because he Anyway, you get the just, um, you know, Lex is a bit of a fraud. It kind of is what it is. Lex is a bit of a fraud. It kind of is what it blood clot is moving on from that one let's talk about this this is a really funny and interesting fucking clip this is courtesy of the account on twitter over and under one of my favorite accounts to follow for all your streetwear sneakers and fashion and cultural news it features one of the owners of hellstar basically saying that they were able to trade some i guess maybe unreleased hellstar maybe some others just stock in general for the virgil abloh designed mercedes maybach yes you heard that right some idiot some kid some kid had the virgil design maybach the one that's like you know um half brown and half black you i'm sure most of you guys have seen it they swapped the maybach that virgil designed for some stock of hellstar i can't think of again i love i like hellstar it's a cool brand i kind of see hellstar as like the u.s version of cortese in terms of their like you know um in terms of the love they get from the fans and you know how they're kind of moving and shit i kind of see a lot of parallels between them i'd actually would like to see a collab between the two of them i think that would be fucking sick but i don't think hellstar makes good enough clothes to ever warrant this type of swap because i don't even think someone would do this for balenciaga 
let alone fucking Hellstar. So it's kind of wild to see where they are as a brand because this signifies, you know, the value that some, you know, how people value them. They place them in the same category as like, you know, a prestigious brand like Maybach and fucking Mercedes is fucking wild. But this is a funny, interesting clip. And again, I, I'd love to know who the kid is, probably a kid that's probably got more money than, you know, they know what to do with. Uh, maybe they've got a couple of these in the, in, maybe they have another one dead stock at home that they don't want to open up. But this is a crazy video. You want to know how we, I got this tool? How? I traded Hailstar t-shirts for it. Really? <laughs> yeah, we traded Hailstar for it, bro. The nigga had to have a lot of money. He did, oh but you God. can resell Hailstar, so I don't, I'm not trying to go resell it. I just, just sell it as it is. So I'm like, look, it's hard for me to get a Virgil. I'd rather just trade him the clothes because he going to make profit because I just traded him the amount of the clothes worth the Virgil. So he can go resell it and now he can make profit. So the if the car is what 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 did the car retail for? Let me see, let me see how much did it retail for? Let's see, uh, let's write this in because I'm fucking curious to see this. Virgil Abloh, uh, Maybach price. Maybe I'm gonna say a hundred grand, or maybe it's two hundred grand. Let's see how much it was retailing for. It retailed for allegedly seven hundred to seven hundred seven hundred twenty nine thousand nine hundred ninety six. 720k how much hellstar could you get for 720k that's nearly a million that must be like that's a lot of hellstar for 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 a car fucking hell bro and not any car right a virgil designed a mercedes maybach s680 allegedly is 150 made allegedly i don't think there is i think there's probably more but still fucking hell can you even buy them second hand? I wonder, can you buy them second hand or are they all gone? We'll check in a bit, but fuck me. But you're and I'm cool. like, I'm gonna just take the Virgil because I can't cool. get it no way, no you other just way. Just trade it your brand. That's how we got all of our cars, bro. My my little brother got a, another Maybach. Juice got a G wagon. Was that the other Maybach that was yeah. over there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we saw the uh, the Juice, one with the B. That's yeah, cool. and Juice got a G wagon with the Hellstar rims on it. I oh seen it, you on the blue. Yeah, yeah, the baby yeah. blue, the baby blue one, the baby blue one. Yeah, man, it's, it's crazy, bro. Aspiration, it's bro. crazy, bro. I could do it, bro. I'm telling you. I'm gonna tell you, you could do it, bro. I was working at Starbucks three years ago, bro. Damn. Working at Starbucks, just dog. three years. Making ago. frappuccino. That's pretty cool, though, as a as a come up story. Working in Starbucks three years ago, and then having a brand that's so valuable, someone's willing to trade a limited edition Virgil Abloh designed Mercedes Maybach for your gums. That's fucking wild, especially when you think about the abundance of streetwear brands. Because nowadays, I feel like it's probably harder than ever to make it as a streetwear brand because there's so many micro brands that exist out there that are doing really well. So for you to kind of make a stink, for you to make some noise online to get people to actually buy your shit, it's, it takes a lot because there's so many smaller micro brands on Instagram only, brands that are local, right, that are doing fucking bits. So for you to kind of get out there and do it, especially competing while with the big dogs at the Stussies and the Supremes of this world while still trying to make your own shit is difficult. So the fact that they've done that says a lot about them, but god almighty i could not imagine ever doing that ever in my entire life but let's actually see this virgil um what's it called virgil abloh mercedes maybach right because i don't know I'm, I'm just trying to think like what what would possess somebody to exchange a car like this for some hellstar t-shirts and hellstar again good brand don't get me wrong but they don't even make they don't even have that much of an as expansive you know range that you would want to buy like they don't even make you know it's just it's mostly t-shirts and sweats they don't really have that much stuff you know like or like in terms of different type of clothing to buy they have t-shirts and sweats long sleeve but it's not like they have jackets it's not like they have like great bags and stuff it's just you know the stuff that you see loads of la guys wearing on podcasts you know like you know some cool stuff some cool screen printed design the graphic design stuff they do is absolutely incredible it's all sold out as you can see here on the website but it's just t-shirts and sweats. There's no like necklaces. There's no cool accessories. No jewelry. It's just basic. Like, you know, the gloves are, I guess, pretty okay. But I don't know. Like, this brand must be doing bits on the streets to have this type of grip. They don't even have like leather jackets, bombers, nothing. Just t-shirts and sweats. And my man swapped all of this shit. Right, the stuff that you see there on the screen. Let's see the Instagram actually. Let's see if they got any 
new stuff on Instagram we haven't seen, maybe a lookbook or something that might give you an idea on what they're about. Because again, like as much as I love Hellstar, like the brand isn't even that, you know, that much of an extensive range to even warrant swapping it for a car that looks like this. Like, why would you do that? Look at this fucking Maybach. It's so beautiful. Two-tone in that almost must, must that, that kind of cream brown color with the black on it like it looks fucking beautiful really does look beautiful what is the virgil ablo maybach let's see actually for courtesy of also called it mercedes benz little Lun. virgil ablo was best known as the founder of high-end brand off-white as well as the artistic director of louis vuitton menswear collection before his unfortunate death of cancer in 2021 r.i.p to the goat ablo collaborated with merge with mercedes again who was doing this isn't it like he did a lot during his time in it on earth man you, you have to give virgil the ratings bro while he was alive he did so fucking much ikea mercedes like fuck you know the curl labs no one does this at this level the only one i can think of who was doing collaborations with at this type of level random ones all over the get place was another one of my goats another one of my heroes hiroshi fujiwara like he's the only person who was really you know putting that fragment you know those fragment bolts those double fragment bolts on like crazy shit but virgil did some bits on here so it says the virtual collaborated with Mercedes-Benz chief designer um, on Project Maybach. The partnership included two unique Maybach vehicles, a massive solar-powered roadster designed for luxury off-roading, which I hope comes out. It's, it'll feature in that Drake video. Hope they do bring that out one time. Um, and a reimagined S6880. The roadster remains under show car status, but the Virgil Abloh Maybach 680 will be available to purchase this April. Celebs have already lined up to buy one, um, one of which is only 150 are made. Let's take a closer look at the car. It looks fucking gorgeous, doesn't it? It looks really good. Look at the rims. Brown interior. So luxurious. It's got Virgil Abloh's name written as well on the insignia. Inside the color scheme remains fully, what does it say? Remains fully cream colored with seats, glossy black accents. The black seat belts are a nice touch though. Um, how much will it be? Um, according to Supercar Blondie, the project cost of the collaboration is double what the standard, yeah, so the standard um, S680 is 230k, and of course, Abloh's one was 700 plus, so to swap this for some Hellstar shit is crazy, bro, crazy fucking work, again, it, it, it's probably the kid of some oil baron or something, right, who probably got more money than they know what to do with, they're like, you know what, fuck it, I love this brand, so let's go, but I couldn't ever imagine doing so. Like, that's just a wild thing to do, bro. But again, you know, if you've got the money to do it, why not? But the brand Hellstar is decent enough, like I said, but I don't think it's decent enough to warrant swapping a car for it. Like, again, it's just sweats, you know? There's some lookbook pictures we've got here on the screen to show you, actually, while going for what they do. It looks good, don't get me wrong. But, you know, when I, when I see Hellstar, I just think of AD. You know, I think of all those guys in LA, right? I think of all those gangbangers who had to wear that like, sweats and t-shirts and shit. That's what I think of. It's it, it's pretty it's pretty decent enough, but nice pants. Like, they they look they look well cut though. The quality of them looks really good. The sweatpants and shit, right? I do like the fact that they don't have elasticated cuffs as well. It's just a raw edge at the bottom. Screen print design to make them look cool. And yeah, look, oh, look at people complaining in the in the comments already about the prices. Um, yeah, $275 for a crew neck is no joke. Ended up being 500 CAD after taxes. I guess it's Canadian dollars. Duties and shipping. Like, I'm going to keep my money. I love this brand, but this is shit. It's not worth it. I always wondered, why do brands go out of their way to charge so much for sweats when they don't need to? I get the money is good, but when you want just repeat customers, like, I'd much rather, like, if I ever started a brand, which I was considering doing for a long time, especially when it comes to basics and stuff, right? Like sweatshirts and whatever. I would I just want to sell like a set for $100 or something, right? Maybe sell a set for $100 and give that as an owner to probably some people to buy it and then maybe sell the separate, more expensive. Maybe have the sweatshirt be 60, the pants be 70 if you want to buy them separately, but together it's $100, cool. But you could get away with basically selling that $100 and still having people come back, even 150 But do you need to really sell a sweatshirt for $275? A sweatshirt with some basic, you know, screen printing or vinyl printing on here. Like, it's not, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's just unnecessarily expensive. I get you're going to get a lot more money back because the cost, the you know, the cost of these bits is probably $5 if that. So you're probably making a crazy amount, um, you know, markup on this. But you don't need to do that. You could just sell it at a fair price, still make some money and then have people come back, you know. Because this doesn't 
look two hundred and seventy five dollars, thousand dollars worth. You know what I mean? Not in the slightest. But yeah, the kids swapped this for fucking a Mercedes car. Wow, 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 wow. It goes to show the people that have have got money, you know, they just are bored, <laughs> really. And if you make a brand that touches people, you know, you could get to a level where people are like, yeah, I wanna. You know, I think your brand is as good or as fucking well regarded as fucking stuff like Mercedes. So fair play, fair fucking play. But me personally, I don't get it. It's decent enough. Even to be fair, I take it back. I think Cortez do a much better job. Cortez have much better stuff than this. To be fair, the Cortez stuff is much better. Way more, way more of a range. I don't think they actually have anything available to buy at the store now because it's always closed. But Cortez have way better. Yeah, it's okay, it's closed now at the moment. But they have way better stuff than them than fucking Hellstar it's actually a really good range they have down jackets duffel bag underwear bits and shit like actual stuff that you would re- like if, if someone said they swapped you know a bunch of core tees for a Range Rover SV or something right I would believe that that would make a lot more sense oh it's private account okay cool it doesn't matter I'm not gonna bother checking it but um let's actually I think they've actually got a Twitter account as well don't they um let's see core CRT Cortez run the world. I think they've got a Twitter account where they also post some stuff. So maybe I'll show you what their stuff looks like. But I don't know. There's never going to be a, a, a time in my life where I could ever picture that. To be completely honest, let's see here. They're, they've got a Twitter account where they post some clothes. But I think Cortez actually is better. Like as much as I say they're similar, maybe in the operation and how they do stuff. Like you know, guerrilla marketing is kind of done all in house. You know, independent brand. Blah blah blah. Hellstar which is great maybe i don't know if it is maybe is it independent maybe they've got some investment i'm not too sure but either way it's cool but it's pretty one-dimensional isn't it? it's just sweatshirts the graphic design is what the strongest thing about hellstar they've got really good graphic designers the graphics are fucking incredibly good to be fair graphic design is really fucking good but the items themselves are kind of basic at least with core tees you get sub sub you get some substance with core tees you get quite a lot of substance here I'll show you when it kind of fucking decides to load up on my screen. Bidi 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 boom. So if you scroll down here on the Cortez Twitter account, Cortez Run the World RTW, you'll see quite a lot of good stuff on here. Actually, some cargoes, some good little shit and stuff, right? So the full collection was there. They did recently a nice kind of mystery archive lot of thing, getting rid of loads of old stock. I like how they do that as well, by the way. Um, nice little money bag thing with the, the shoe there. Let's scroll down. Yeah, there's some good stuff. Like Cortez do some good shit. Like, let's not lie. The stuff is really fucking good. You can see there like hats and stuff, sweatshirts. Like the stuff is really good. Especially some of these fucking the trousers and the cargos. I really like because I'm not really a fan of crotch screen printing. Even when Billionaire Boys Club did that back in the day or Bape and stuff, I never was a fan of that. But I think it works really well with Cortez. They've got the Alcatraz logo here, screen pins on the crotch. It looks fucking really good. And the cut of the cargoes is pretty well done as well. I love the label on them. It looks fucking awesome in different colours, camos and all the other colours as well. It looks fucking hard, I'm not going to lie. Nice trucker hats as well, decent shape, nice vests as well, good quality on nose. And look at the jackets, look at all the jackets. Nice paneling on the jackets. Um, zip ties on the side here to cinch them in nice little down jackets and shit like Cortez is actually way more I would understand if somebody legitimately swapped a Range Rover Sport for some archive Cortez or like a whole collection worth that would make a lot more sense to me than Hellstar because Hellstar is just sweatshirts and t-shirts at least with Cortez they have all this sick shit like you can't deny it, it looks fucking awesome really good good shorts as well so but anyway big up hellstar regardless even though i don't really rate the brand too tough i feel like the journey i'd actually see love to see an interview with a guy actually to go from working at starbucks to then suddenly you know selling this amazing brand where someone's going to be willing to swap a mercedes for it you know you're probably doing something right so i'd actually I'd like to hear what he has to say about certain things and see his come up and what it was about but yeah big up hellstar big up over and under for that bit of information as well very much appreciated very much appreciated moving on from that one let's go to this one this is actually quite interesting too so lily allen um is recently been talking about you know her sobriety and how she's much in a much more healthy place now and i thought this had a lot of relations to this recent clip i've seen of burt kreischer where he's basically having another come to jesus moment about how he drinks too much and he needs to stop blah blah blah, blah. 
the reason why I thought this was very interesting was because Lily Allen says something very bleak, right? In terms of the reasons why she's not relapsing or not going back to drinking or doing drugs and shit, right? This is the headline courtesy of NME. It says Lily Allen, once banned from Groucho Club, says she stands to lose everything if she drinks again. And I was wondering, maybe this is the missing ingredient. People like, you know, addicts like fucking Bert who are in denial and still coming to grips around, you know, why where they are where they are and shit. Maybe the maybe the key to it is actually having something to lose. Like you actually have something to lose if you don't get your life in order. And maybe Lily that's what Millian's motivation is. Like if you if I don't if I go back to how I was before, I actually risk losing my family and my husband and I can't obviously risk to lose that so that's why it's kind of keeping off it as opposed to like oh i'm over it and i don't have the urge anymore no i have the urges but the negatives far away the positive so let's read the article itself it's courtesy of let me actually pause this video i hate these fucking autoplay videos lily allen has said she stands to lose everything if she drinks again the singer and actor has been sober for nearly five years having struggled with binge drinking and drug abuse in the past last march allen um last march allen uh, explained in a uh, that her life had changed so much since she just decided to quit during a recent podcast on the episode of Miss Me, the Smile star and her co-host Makita Oliver. Oh shit, Makita Oliver. I haven't heard about her in years, bro. She's an OG fucking presenter on TV back in the day. Fucking hell, Makita fucking Oliver. Shit. Um, Makita Oliver were asked whether they had ever been barred from a pub. The quote, I don't think I've ever been barred from a pub, Alan responded. I've been banned from a club, Groucho's. I was banned for a year. Who's laughing now, Groucho's? Hilarious. Located on Dean Street, Groucho Club described itself as the world's renowned arts and media private members club and remains a bastion of refuge of arts in London. The funny thing about being banned at a place like Groucho is that if you're not aware, private members club, especially in London, they're kind of like clandestine places where people get up to no nonsense. So as long as you've got a membership, you can basically get up to quite a lot of shit in the private members club, whether it's drugs, you know, other shit. Like, you can get away with quite a lot. They kind of do a good job of kind of keeping stuff behind closed doors. So to get banned from there, considering how much they let you get away with, it means you're a proper out of control. Like, you are proper going crazy. So Lily Allen must have had a really wild time back in the day. Um, later, Oliver praised Allen for her for still being able to go to the pub without drinking which is interesting right imagine i i, I don't think I, would, I, I could do that if that was me if i had an issue with drugs and alcohol and i had to go sober i don't think i could then go to a pub and just hang out i couldn't do that no way so people that can do that amazing fucking discipline and self-control she says um she prays her without going to uh, with her ability to go to a pub without drinking alcohol when asked what her secret was the singer replied i don't know really i'm just used to it now it's been nearly five years of sobriety coming up this summer i don't know if there's a secret in my early days of sobriety i did a lot of work i went to a lot of meetings i did my step work and i had a sponsor but then in lockdown i obviously didn't go to any meetings and i haven't really been to the habit of going there ever since though sometimes i do online ones she continued and says, I suppose I live with the benefit of being sober. So I know that I stand to lose if I start to drink again, which is everything. My life has pretty much never been as good as it is now. I've got a beautiful house. My kids are happy. They're engaged. I'm connected with them. I have a good relationship with my husband. I have money. I have creative outlets. Everything is good. I don't think that would be the case if I wasn't sober. Alan and added, first of all, I've never really got, get cravings, actually. Sometimes when I'm in a restaurant in the summer and somebody gets a really beautiful looking crisp glass of red white wine, then I might be like, oh, that looks nice. But then I think, yeah, so does your house. Your house looks nice. You see, this is the thing that I think is the key to why Bert is never going to change. Because Bert has enablers. Bert's wife enables him. Bert's kids, in a way, kind of enable him. And Bert's family enable him. Because basically he's the main breadwinner for his entire family right but is the powerhouse he's the one that makes all the money he's the one that tours around the world so he makes so much money that everyone kind of stands to lose something if the guy doesn't take off his t-shirt doesn't take a shot doesn't go to the drink doesn't go to a bar afterwards and have drinks with the fucking fans and have shots with them as well it's actually gonna hurt them as well so they kind of have to manage and kind of you know keep the guardrails around him but the idea of him quitting and shit isn't really a priority to them because you know his whole business is centered around drinking and they benefit from it from going to great colleges from having a nice car having a nice house like i'm pretty sure that he kind of 
is able to kind of look after most of them, especially if they want the money. Maybe they don't want it, but because I think Bert does have some sisters, I'm pretty sure he does, you know, financially support a lot of these people. And he also doesn't stand to lose everything. I think Bert Kreischer probably makes more money than, than fucking Lily Allen. <laughs> Bert Kreischer probably makes more money than Lily Allen, even though Lily Allen, you'd say, you know, is probably more talented than Bert Kreischer, right? Probably has a bit more of a higher ceiling, could probably do way more things artistically. But I think Bert Kreischer probably makes more money than her. Maybe he has more money even from his dad and shit or whatever. But if he was to get fucked up, it wouldn't negatively affect his business. His podcast numbers would go up. People would want to see him perform more on stage. So it doesn't really hurt him. It probably only hurts him to get fucked up and to be a bit of a liability commercially when it comes to working with like big network or big companies like Netflix and stuff, right? If he maybe fucks up too much, he might be in jeopardy of like, you know, burning the bridges that way. But when it comes to himself, like he's, there's nothing that's going to stop him apart from death itself. So he doesn't have any reason to change. So I think Lily Allen saying, hey, like, you know, if I have a drink, I'm going to then, go, I'm going to try and get a baggie. If I have a baggie, then I'm going to go fucking crazy. I'm going to lose my house and I'm going to lose my family. I don't want that. So that's why I'm going to stop drinking. That's why I stopped off. So it's kind of like a negative thing. It's the reason why you're not drinking. Whereas with Bert, there's only quote unquote positives for his brand. So when I hear Bert do these, stories and go on these fucking long drawn out explanations about him now suddenly having to come to jesus moment i think to myself this is the same shit he says every six months or so so i don't believe this in the slightest nothing's going to change but it's interesting to hear the addict rationalization of where he's at and why things are now going to be different even though they're not because he has no reason to change because his life is made so in a way where it kind of benefits him to be a degenerate in a way. So let's hear the clip of Bert basically trying to convince himself that he's now realised that he was out of control and he's trying to change his ways. Bullshit in my opinion, but let's hear him out anyway. Fucking tighten up, motherfucker, because you're now on a path where you're out of control and you don't know it. That would be, you, that's, you never know it. You, you never know it. Not while you're in it, but you need either a doctor or fucking a good friend, or somebody who's not well, had, afraid to piss you off. I had Tom. I mean, I look at the podcast we did uh, when he moved to Austin. Yeah. And like when we first moved to Austin. Don't get me wrong. I think he has a skin condition anyway. But the redness of Bert's face always tells a story. I know he probably has a skin condition. He's white. He probably doesn't moisturize. He probably doesn't put on any sunblock or what do you call it? Um, sun lotion and shit when he goes out. And what I'm sure that's the case. But his face tells a million stories. You can tell from his face that he's been boozing. He likes to drink. He's never going to turn down a drink if you, you know, say you want to get him one. So it doesn't really matter what he says. You know, the evidence, you know, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. Then I look at them and I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure they were fun or whatever. But like, I was really out of control, and Tom would tell me that privately and on air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would, and I just wouldn't hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just yeah, was yeah. like, You're in it. I was like, and I was so bloated. I look at pictures yeah, yeah. of my. Oh, and they're not hearing people too. That's the other side of things about the exhaustion. Because I've, I've, I think again, I'm, I'm lucky because I don't really have any friends. So I don't really, you know, have to have these situations um, where I kind of tell somebody about themselves and shit. But I'd imagine if you have close friends that are spiraling, one of the worst things to kind of deal with is the fact that you can tell them that they're spiraling and pull them to one side, but you also know they're not going to listen to you. So you almost feel like you're wasting your words. You almost feel like your concern is it doesn't really matter because they're not going to listen. They're going to continue doing what they're doing. That's probably the hardest part I'd imagine, you know? So in this case, you just have to kind of let him get there when he gets there. But then the problem is along the way, will he still be here by the time he gets there? Do you know what I mean? That's the issue. It's kind of, like, it's really life and death, especially at his age. He's like, you know, mid, he's approaching his mid fifties and shit, still acting like an adult frat boy. It's like, it's not going to end well if you, if you think about it, which is counter to my suggestion or my theory was that he'll probably outlive all these comedic peers because I think, unfortunately, Bert's one of those type of people that just is going to get away with it. Like in terms of like, you know, no lethal consequences um he doesn't i don't think he even has diabetes or anything i mean that's how fucking fortunate he is but i think he might be one of those lucky people who that despite his horrible lifestyle and choices he would still get away with the things that he does because he's just a lucky person and he's been kind of gifted quote-unquote genes that allow him to drink um and be shitty with his body and shit with stuff with eats and whatever it may be until a very long time as opposed to other people in his friendship group like the joe rogans of this world who go out of his way to like do trt hgh saunas or cold plunges and most likely i think but will definitely outlive rogan that's my theory 
face. For a while. And it's like, it's like really like, and I, and I was like, I remember thinking, I don't look that bad. Yeah. I, I know better now, having had conversations with people in my life that have shared things with me that I didn't know were happening. Uh, uh, I know now how out of control I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I didn't know. You don't know when yeah, you're yeah, out of control. True. You really just feel like I'm getting shit done. I was making a ton of money. Things were Every, working. Everyone was working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, Agreed. we're finally fucking doing it. Um, that thing is happening. Yeah, the only thing I regret I regret, and this is a weird. And that's, that's see, that's the thing I've said about the money thing. I think the money thing is a big deal, because I think Lily Allen, although she's from a famous family, right, that's famously Keith Allen. I think she's still a bit more in the financially fraught position. Then, but I think if Lily Allen did fuck up again, and she didn't, imagine she gets divorced. Imagine that the husband's like, "Hey, if you relapse, I'm going to divorce you," and then he gets fucking custody of the kids, all that sort of shit. Your life can quickly spiral. You lose the sponsorship. You get thrown off your podcast. All this sort of stuff. So Lee Lennon is probably in a way more tinted position. Even though she's super talented and a famous as fuck. Probably more famous than Burt, I'd think, overall. You'd imagine. Um, she probably is in a position where like, if she does succumb to drinking again, she could lose everything. And it could never come back. Whereas if Burt got into an issue. Imagine he got into some issue where, God forbid, he touched some woman during a, a night out, right? When he was fucked up. It might he might lose Netflix, he might lose some other things, like, you know, liquid death and shit. But I don't think his podcasts would suffer. His shows wouldn't suffer. He should still be able to make, you know, however many millions he makes per year on those two things alone. So that is probably a big motivation in that, you know, how bad can things really get? Not really that bad for him. So that must not give him the onus to change. But that's also not a right way to go about life. You don't need to think, oh, just because it can't get bad, I should just continue doing this bad thing. You know, and you shouldn't wait until it gets super bad for you to change. You should change, you know, when you got the option or when you can decide to change, not when you're forced to change. Weird, subtle regret. If I regret my podcast presence from March of 2003 to like July. You said 2003? 2023. 2023. Okay. To July. That was a fraudulent slip. He did mean 2023, by the way. That was a fraudulent slip. He did mean 2003. <laughs> <laughs> 2013 is still bad, by the way, but he did mean 2003. By 2023, because, and I look back at myself, and I remember one interview which I thought was brilliant. I really did think was like fun as yeah, fucking yeah, yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah. It was with Joe DeRosa and Sal Vulcano. And I look back and I realize I can see it. Not only if you can see it, but I can see how out of control I was. And I think that was actually even before this. Mm -hmm. But like, I can just see this guy that was like, on a freight train and i know this from sh having conversations with my family who said i was just i was gone i was not listening to yeah. you know what's funny he says this every six months his family will have a little like hey bro you might want to chill out right because i've just you know seeing your dad every day you know hungover or sleeping with his mouth open on in the you know in the living room smelling like a fucking brewery it's probably a bit unsettling and then they stop and then he says, yeah, I'm going to get better. Then he starts working out, you know, drinking fucking a box wine while he's running on the treadmill and shit. So I think his family say stuff to him all the time. He just doesn't listen. But I also think they enable him because he's, a, you know, he pays the bills. He keeps lights on. He, he provides an amazing lifestyle for them. Like Leanne Kreischer lives like a fucking queen. She is a lovely person, don't get me wrong, but she lives amazing. So why would she tell her husband that's been able to provide her with this amazing life? you know, provide everything they want for their kids to stop doing the thing that makes them all this money. <sighs> Tough one, isn't it? Yeah, 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 I had yeah, blinders yeah, on. Yeah. For me, it was like, make, I had this uh, this thing, make hay while the sun shines. People are buying tickets to shows. Go, people go, are, people go. are buying, yeah, you got yeah, a yeah. special remote, you got a movie remote, you got a TV yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, everything was like this. And now I look back and I go, I wish I had been a tad bit more present in those interviews. Yeah. I don't ever want to be at a place where I can't drink around people because yeah. it makes them uncomfortable. Totally. So I, I felt like I, I don't ever want to be in a place where I can't drink in front of people that makes them un Wow, what a weird way to think. Shouldn't it be the opposite way? Like you're concerned if you're sober, you don't want to make other people's fun go away. He's, fuck man, his brain is br 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 broken. I had to show everyone. I can stop, I can slow down. I, I, had, to yeah, show yeah. To, I had to show to myself, yeah, yeah, really. Because yeah. the thing was, like, I don't give a fuck. When you stop drinking, everyone's, no one notices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, everyone notices. See, see how his brain works? He thinks he's a much better person and he's alive and he's a center of attention and he's amazing when he boozes. 
he actually that's why I think he's not going to quit anytime soon because he actually legitimately enjoys drinking like he describes it anyway he always describes it very eloquently how much he enjoys it, the buzz the taste of a drink da, da, da. he actually loves it and I think he loves how he comes across when he's drinking he loves how he's like you know loose and free and funny and caring and open and the life of the party all this malarkey it's just a non-stop fucking party it's a non-stop cruise for him non-stop fucking cruise it's like sometimes a party has to end even i've realized that being a party boy and being a rave guy sometimes a party ends and sometimes or most of the time it's better that you decide when to leave the party as opposed to getting kicked out you don't want that but some people do some people do wait until they get kicked out before they leave whereas it's nice to leave on your own terms you know and kind of decide what you want to do going forward but this guy actually enjoys it and it's like fuck bro like you're 50 you're 50 bro like relax you're 50 only you notice and then i had to do a period of time where i was like but even a month i used to do a month all the time we used to do months for yeah, sober exactly. october but it's got to be longer than a month because you because you really have to they didn't do months by the way they did a month sober october is a month see how it, it twists and lies they didn't do months they did a month sober october is not months it's in the name sober october they did month and sometimes he cheat so let's not get into that to sit in it yeah, yeah you have yeah. to sit in it to a place where you go i don't know when i'll drink again. yeah yeah i think that's right and then you have to get to a place where when people go are you drinking you say no yeah, yeah. for real you mean it yeah, yeah, and then yeah. they go how long you go, I oh my god he's struggling but yeah um the lily allen thing about losing everything is the thing that i think has made her stop which is very honest it's not even like a internal oh i just decided i stopped it's an admit it's that you don't really have the conviction yourself to stop you need a a motivator and the motivator is your lovely house your lovely family your husband the fact that you were in a good position now in life money wise you don't want to lose those things so those are the things like it's a threat of like loss that's that's making you do the right thing which is a good thing still because on the other side you got Bert who's got everything that he wants and then that's giving him no reason to change you know what I mean so you got to pick your poison what would you rather have something but know if you did something, it could fuck up everything or have everything and have no reason to change. It's a tough one. It's a fucking tough one. It really fucking is. Let's also move on to this topic. This is really good as well. Um, I was speaking uh, the other day about this recent club that opened in Wuppertal, Germany, which is next to like Dusseldorf on the west side of Germany. And um, there's a couple of new clubs opening. One in particular I'm going to talk about now, but the one that I was mentioning beforehand is called Open Ground, if I'm not mistaken, right? It's called Open Ground. And now there's another club opening up in the same um, city called Wuppertal, um, courtesy of Mixed Mag, which is called Crowd Club. And this club is 120 capacity. For me, this is my, this is my favorite number. I think if I, when I do eventually open up my own bar and club, if it's a specific club, I'd like the club to be under 500. But if I did have a choice, I'd love it to be anywhere between 150 to 200 capacity. I think that's a perfect number. It kind of reminds me of, um, what's the thing called? Of, uh, not vision, what's that? Plastic people, that's the thing. It reminds me of Plastic People. There was this club in London back in the day we used to go to called Plastic People in Shoreditch, right? one of the best nightclubs ever, but it was tiny. I think the capacity might have been 200. It was a sweat box, but it was one of the best clubs ever. And it closed. It doesn't exist anymore. It was on Curtin Road in Shoreditch. And it was one of the best clubs ever. And that was one of my inspirations about, okay, if I ever do, or when I do ever have a club, that's where I'd like to have it. You know, this small club, basement area, a great sound system, amazing fucking nights there back in the day. You know, you see Scream back in the day, they're performing and shit. I went to this place so many fucking times back in the day. I fucking love Plastic People. One of the best venues ever. Um, so that's the kind of place that I'd like to go open up, that kind of place. I think Plastic People capacity, it must have been 200. Let me see the capacity of it. Plastic People must have had a 200 capacity capacity let's see what the capacity was for capacity people was it 200 what was the capacity of it it doesn't say does it oh man sub 200 plus people sub 200 capacity so around the same so big up um this new club in fucking um Wuppertal. so i'm really curious to go um i think Wuppertal is the same city that has that really cool um train track that kind of hangs if i'm not mistaken right it's that really cool train that I've finally seen on YouTube and shit. Um, it's this, this one. So I would, I'd want to go check out Wuppertal City just for this train. It's the only one that exists, actually. It's the Wuppertal, what's it called? The Wuppertal Schwieberbahn. 
is a suspension railway in Wuppertal, Germany. The line is originally called the German, whatever that word is, named for its inventor, um, Eugene Lagen. And it's the oldest electric elevated railway hanging cars in the world, right? So it's pretty fucking cool. It hangs over you. So you can kind of look at that. It's fucking cool design. So it's basically like, imagine a train, but it's upside down. And it's hanging. So it's but yeah, a, a train upside down hanging under a bridge. And it's all electric. It's fucking cool. So I, I really want to go check out Wuppertal just to ride on that and take some pictures, of course, right? It looks fucking cool. But they've also got some great clubs there, like Open Ground and this place called Crowd Club, courtesy of Mixmag. So the article says, a new venue, um, Crowd Club, is open its doors in Wuppertal, Germany. Launched on the March 30th, the opening party saw sets from Jeleni Jones, um, D Nowhere, and a guy called, somebody called Sabuta, 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 Sabuta founded by local artists Iowa and Jin Bali and Natasha Frank and Who's Lulu the 120 capacity venue is set to within the former nightclub Mauk, Mauki so let's, let's see what Mauki looks like I'm curious to see the inside because a lot of these German clubs you never see the inside of them because German clubs always cover your fucking cameras but I'd like to see just to kind of be curious and be a little bit nosy let's see Wagwan I want to see the inside of this fucking nightclub let's see what the vibe is saying let's see what the vibe is saying so this is the former club where it's hosted in again no pictures of the inside unfortunately for me um maybe i could do this actually maybe if i do this maybe if i go Mauk club maybe we could get it up on google maps let's go Mauk club Wurpel too. so maybe somebody on google maps basically yeah there we go so it's permanently closed but we do have some pictures here let's see what people had to say about Mauk um oh is it okay is it Mauk is <laughs> Mauk is bussy lols Mauk is German for bussy it's fucking hilarious big up super jello we've got some pictures here not a lot but you know we see a bit of a, a place in there let's see the reviews of this place actually what did they say about this place back in the day the reviews great little great little clubby club another one says it's better that this is closed when it was when we asked if it was full we were assured it was full there were 10 people in it okay that's not complaint come on man that's standard nightclub protocol that you shouldn't be complaining about that. What other complaints people say? Disappointing. Another says would be boss, ugly club, rude stuff, blah blah blah. Okay, cool. Let's also check Open World then. Let's see if Open World's got any or what's a crowd club. Let's see if they've got any fucking reviews on Google so we can see what the vibe is saying here before we read the article. Okay, no no reviews of the new place just yet. Let's see. Google reviews. Let's write Google reviews on here anything no have you got anything for us nothing okay cool so it's fairly new no reviews just yet so not even a google review yet so let's continue the team behind crowd club shared on instagram what we love about the idea of a club is creating a living room that is made for everybody who cares about creating a community together that is what we aim to do painting up a new place that can be shared with four people living here becoming more and more becoming one crowd the team told mixmag that the crowd club's ethos will be based on refocusing that truly matters people people on the dance floor at the bars behind the dj booth individuals coming together to, to become part of something greater i like that because that makes a lot of sense if the club is 120 capacity they probably do need everybody to be on top of each other that's what's going to give you the ambience and the vibe so this makes a lot of sense speaking about the very emotional opening event the club adds at this last the better moment before we opened the doors we realized that we had been working on the last two months in addition to developing the brand and the program and so we renovated the entire club together with friends we were on the construction site practically every day for weeks and experiencing this place with all of them for the first time was really special and touching they continue all the pressure came off at once but that evening we also realized that it's always be like this now it's a continuous construction of creating a venue according to our ideas and visions so so it probably won't always be perfect, but it always will come to heart. I think that might actually be my thing, you know. Forget fucking buying a house and shit. I think my thing, my fucking, you know, my thing thing might be to eventually open a club. 100%. Because that must be so fun. It's going to be really hard. It'll probably be really stressful. There's a high probability it won't work out. 
but having the ability to open your own club and create your own little community from there launch people's careers um you know be able to be a monumental little remembering point for people in their life right in terms of a time stamp of their life they can kind of look back on book yourself to play like that's the main thing that would be fucking incredible crack club has already shared a huge lineup of artists running throughout april including narcissist back to back with fuck off on april 6th as well as other events happening i like the i like the creative directing and uh what you call it the font they're using there as well for this april listing some good nights there this weekend they have somebody called Mizerbub with shuma and another person called even back to back with oh, or playing with dj palaga i like how these places are also got obviously they've got big names like narcissist and fuck off but they've got loads of i guess un unknown or local people i think that's really cool so a big up for them for hiring or for booking people that aren't the baitists. And let's actually see what Aria is saying about the, if they've got any other listings here. So let's go Crowd Club, Werpertal Aria. I want to see what else, who else is going to be playing here coming up soon. So new venue, Werpertal. Let's actually see what who else is playing here. Because I really want to go Werpertal, honestly. The flights are really cheap. Um, The fucking... Um, the Airbnb accommodation is fucking brilliant, honestly. It's like, it reminds me of the old days of Berlin. 150 for the weekend, 150 euros, as opposed to now in Berlin, like for a weekend fucking stay, it's like 300 euros plus if you want your own place. Because I hate... I already don't really like Airbnbs. I only really do Airbnb stays because sometimes I like to stream when I'm there. Last time I went to Berlin, I streamed a bit. It was quite fun, to be fair. To be a bit fucked up over there, streaming on, online was fucking fun. And I like my own space and shit. But sometimes the... the the benefit of like you get you know you get a house you get a fridge you get like a nice space you get a system you can kind of fuck around with and shit um but sometimes in berlin if the prices are too expensive for my own place i'll go and get a room somewhere right but then the rooms as well it's like <sighs> to stay in a room of somebody's house for the weekend it's so weird it's such a weird feeling to know that other people are in the house and you're having to kind of step around them and not be around too long and jump in the shower super early so you don't waste i mean it's just a wait for them to go in there before it's such an odd thing so you know maybe hotels are a way to go but even hotels in berlin are really expensive so at least with work it's kind of cheap so you can kind of figure it out so i really want to check it out and go man because it seems like a fun place to check out but yeah big up um crowd club it looks fucking fun i really want to see what it looks like on the inside i'm gonna have to probably wait to get there oh let's mount some pictures on the inside there we go what we expect it to be small club nice vibe nice little vibe there bartenders and shit yeah i'm definitely gonna check it out i can't wait and it looks like a you know they book a bit of a more of a diverse lineup not the usual you know dudes that play all the same places again so yeah definitely gonna check out crowd club if you do as well let me know if you go i'd love to know what you guys think of it if you do end up going anyways my friends that's been it episode number 764 of the agassino zynga show thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company so much i really have flipping enjoyed it if you is your first time checking out my pod or checking out the live stream if you're watching on youtube make sure you smash the like button if you're listening via the podcast apps please leave me a five-star review that'd be greatly appreciated i've seen some on there but i haven't seen any on the apple side in a while so if you could do me a favor and leave me a five-star review on apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform you use spotify or wherever else you can leave reviews please do that so people know that you enjoy the show and who knows maybe fucking someone will reach out and say you know what we love you i guess you know we see people love you we're gonna fucking sponsor you and give you a million dollars and then i'm gonna spend that all on cat who fucking knows either way thank you so much for joining it's been a pleasure never ever 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 a chore and i'm going to leave you with my tune of the day so for those who are listening via the audio podcast you will hear my tune of the day playing underneath my voice and for those of you who are watching the podcast you will hear my tune of the day is none other none other than azarian third i'm hungry for the love um i've always flipping loved this track i've been thinking about it more and more ever since um you know i've been listening to the fucking what's her name fabiana paladino um album i really fucking enjoyed that so it kind of reminded me of hungry for the power one of my favorite songs of all time back in the day so big up fucking azarian third so this will be the tune that's going to be playing out here for those of you watching or listening to the fucking podcast itself so again thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure never a chore i really have enjoyed here being with you and if you've enjoyed it too please let me know by smashing the like button and obviously leave me a five-star review wherever you may be and i'll see you guys again very very soon